The Mouse by James Kerwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Rowdy Delaney, Idaho, USA. The Mouse by James Kerwood. Why, you ornery little cuss! said Faulkner, pausing with a forkful of beans halfway to his mouth. Where in God Almighty's name did you come from? It was against all of Jim's crude but honest ethics of the big wilderness to take the Lord's name in vain, and the words he uttered were filled more with the softness of a prayer than the harshness of profanity. He was big, and his hands were hard and knotted, and his face was covered with a coarse red scrub of beard. But his hair was blonde, and his eyes were blue, and just now were filled with unbounded amazement. Slowly the fork loaded with beans descended to his plate, and he said again, barely above a whisper, Where in God Almighty's name did you come from? There was nothing human in the one room of his wilderness cabin to speak of. At first glance there was nothing alive in the room, with the exception of Jim Faulkner himself. There was not even a dog, for Jim had lost his dog weeks before. And yet he spoke, and his eyes glistened, and for a full minute after that he sat as motionless as a rock. Then something moved, at the farther end of the rough-board table. It was a mouse, a soft, brown, bright-eyed little mouse, not as large as his thumb. It was not like the mice Jim had been accustomed to see in the north woods, the larger, sharp-nosed, rat-like creatures which sprung his traps now and then and he gave a sort of gasp through his beard. I'm crazy as a loon if it isn't a sure enough down-home mouse, just like we used to catch in the kitchen down in Ohio, he told himself. And for the third time he asked, Now where in God Almighty's name did you come from? The mouse made no answer. It humped itself up in a little ball, and was eyeing Jim with the keenest of suspicion. You're a thousand miles from home, old man, Faulkner addressed it still without a movement. You're a clean thousand miles straight north of the kind of civilization you was born in, and I want to know how you got here. By George, is it possible you got mixed up in that box of stuff she sent up? Did you come from her? He made a sudden movement, as if he expected an answer, and in a flash the mouse had scurried off the table and disappeared under his bunk. The little cuss, said Faulkner, he sure got his nerve. He went on eating his beans, and when he was done he lighted a lamp, for the half-arctic darkness was falling early, and began to clear away the dishes. When he had done he put a scrap of bannock and a few beans on the corner of the table. "'I'll bet he's hungry, the little cuss,' he said, a thousand miles, in that box." He sat down close to the sheet-iron box stove, which was glowing red-hot, and filled his pipe. Kerosene was a precious commodity, and he had turned down the lamp wick until he was mostly in gloom. Outside, a storm was wailing down across the barrens from the north. He could hear the swish of the spruce boughs overhead, and those moaning, half-shrieking sounds which always came with a storm out of the north, and sometimes even fooled him into thinking they were human cries. They had seemed more and more human to him during the past three days, and he was growing afraid. Once or twice, strange thoughts had come into his head, and he had tried to fight them down. He had known of men whom loneliness had driven mad, and he was terribly lonely. He shivered as a piercing blast of wind filled with a morning wail swept over the cabin. And that day, too, he had been taken with a touch of fever. It burned more hotly in his blood tonight, and he knew that it was the loneliness, the emptiness of the world about him the despair and black foreboding that came to him with the first early twilight of the long night. For he was in the edge of that long night. For weeks he would only now and then catch a glimpse of the sun. He shuddered. A hundred and fifty miles to the south and east there was Hudson's Bay Post. Eighty miles south was the nearest trapper's cabin he knew of. Two months before he had gone down to the post, with a thick beard to cover his face, and brought back supplies and the box. His wife had sent up the box to him, only it had come to him as John Blake, 
instead of Jim Faulkner, his right name. There were things in it for him to wear, and pictures of the sweet-faced wife who was still filled with prayer and hope for him, and of the kid, their boy. He is walking now, she had written to him, and a dozen times a day he goes to your picture and says, Papa, Papa, and every night we talk about you before we go to bed, and pray God to send you back to us soon. God bless him, breathed Jim. He had not lighted his pipe, and there was something in his eyes that shimmered and glistened in the dull light. And then, as he sat silent, his eyes clearing, he saw that the little mouse had climbed back onto the edge of the table. It did not eat the food that he placed there for it, but humped itself in a tiny ball again, and its tiny, shining eyes looked in his direction. "'You're not hungry,' said Jim, and he spoke aloud. "'You're lonely, too. That's it.' A strange thrill shot through him at the thought, and he wondered again if he was mad at the longing that filled him, the desire to reach out and snuggle the little creature in his hand, and hold it close up to his bearded face, and to talk to it. He laughed, and drew his stool a little more into the light. The mouse did not run. He edged nearer and nearer, until his elbow rested on the table, and a curious feeling of pleasure took the place of the loneliness when he saw the mouse was looking at him and yet seemed unafraid. "'Don't be scared,' he said softly, speaking directly to it. "'I won't hurt you. No siree. I'd—I'd I'd cut off my hand before I'd do that. I ain't had any company but you for two months. I ain't seen a human face, or heard a human voice. Nothing. Nothing but them shrieks and wails and baby cryings out there in the wind. I won't hurt you.' His voice was almost pleading in its gentleness and for the tenth time that day he felt, with his fever, a sickening dizziness in his head. For a moment or two his vision was blurred, but he could still see the mouse, farther away, it seemed to him. "'I don't suppose you've killed anyone, or anything,' he said, and his voice seemed thick and distant to him. "'Mice don't kill, do they? They live on cheese. But I have. I've killed. I killed a man. That's why I'm here.' His dizziness overcame him, and he leaned heavily against the table. Still the mouse did not move. Still he could see it through the strange gauze veil before his eyes. "'I killed a man,' he repeated, and now he was wondering why the mouse did not say something at that remarkable confession. "'I killed him, old man, and you'd have done the same if you'd have been in my place. I didn't mean to. I struck too hard. But I found him in my cabin and she was fighting, fighting until her face was scratched and her clothes were torn, God bless her heart, fighting him to the last breath, and I came in just in time. He didn't think I'd be back for a day. A black-hearted devil we fed when he came to our door hungry. I killed him, and they've hunted me ever since. They'll put a rope round my neck and choke me to death if they catch me, because I came in time to save her. That's law. But they won't find me, I've been up here a year now, and in the spring I'm going down, where you came from, back to the girl and the kid. The policeman won't be looking for me then, and we're going to some other part of the world, and live happy. She's waiting for me, she and the kid. They know I'm coming in the spring. Yes, sir, I killed a man, and they want to kill me for it. That's the law, Canadian law, the law that wants an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and where there ain't no extenuating circumstances. They call it murder. But it wasn't, was it? He waited for an answer. The mouse seemed going farther and farther away from him. He leaned more heavily on the table. It wasn't, was it? He persisted. His arms reached out, his head dropped forward, and the little mouse scurried to the floor. But Faulkner did not know it had gone. I killed him, and I guess I'd do it again, he said and his words were only a whisper. And tonight they're praying for me down there, she and the kid, and he's saying, Papa, Papa, and they sent you up to keep me company. His head dropped wearily upon his arms. The red stove crackled and turned slowly black. In the cabin it grew darker, except where the dim light burned on the table. Outside the storm wailed and screeched down across the barren, and after a time the mouse came back. It looked at Jim Faulkner. It came nearer, until it touched the unconscious man's sleeve. 
More daringly it ran over his arm. It smelled of his fingers. Then the mouse returned to the corner of the table, and began eating the food that Faulkner had placed there for it. The wick of the lamp had burned low when Faulkner raised his head. The stove was black and cold. Outside, the storm still raged, and it was the shivering shriek of it over the cabin that Faulkner first heard. He felt terribly dizzy, and there was a sharp, knife-like pain just back of his eyes. By the gray light that came through the window, he knew that what was left of the Arctic day had come. He rose to his feet, and staggered about like a drunken man as he rebuilt the fire, and he tried to laugh as the truth dawned upon him that he had been sick, and that he had rested for hours with his head on the table. He seemed broken. His legs were numb, and hurt when he stepped on them. He swung his arms a little to bring back the circulation, and rubbed his hands over the fire that began to crackle in the stove. It was the sickness that had overcome him, he knew that. But the thought of it did not appall him as it had yesterday, and the day before. There seemed to be something in the cabin now that comforted and soothed him, something that took away part of the loneliness that was driving him mad. Even as he searched about him, peering into the dark corners and the bare walls, a word formed on his lips, and he half smiled. It was a woman's name, Hester. A warmth entered into him. The pain left his head. For the first time in weeks he felt different. And slowly he began to realize what had wrought the change. He was not alone. A message had come to him from one who was waiting for him miles away. Something that lived, and breathed, and was as lonely as himself. It was the little mouse. He looked about eagerly, his eyes brightening, but the mouse was gone. He could not hear it. There seemed nothing unusual to him in the words he spoke aloud to himself. "'I'm going to call it after the kid,' he chuckled. "'I'm going to call it Little Jim. I wonder if it's a girl mouse, or a boy mouse.' He placed a pan of snow water on the stove, and began making his simple preparations for breakfast. For the first time in many days he felt actually hungry. And then all at once he stopped, and a low cry that was half joy and half wonder broke from his lips. With tensely gripped hands and eyes that shone with a strange light, he stared straight at the blank surface of the log wall, through it, and a thousand miles away. He remembered that day, years ago, the scenes of which came to him now as though they had been but yesterday. It was afternoon, in the glorious summer, and he had gone to Hester's home. Only the day before Hester had promised to be his wife and he remembered how fidgety and uneasy and yet wondrously happy he was as he sat out on the big white veranda, waiting for her to put on her pink muslin dress, which went so well with the gold of her hair and the blue of her eyes. And as he sat there, Hester's Maltese pet came up the steps, bringing in its jaws a tiny, quivering brown mouse. It was playing with the almost lifeless little creature when Hester came through the door. He heard again the low cry that came from her lips then, in an instant she had snatched the tiny, limp thing from between the cat's paws, and had faced him. He was laughing at her, but the glow in her blue eyes sobered him. "'I didn't think you would take pleasure in that, Jim,' she said. "'It's only a mouse, but it's alive, and I can feel its poor little heart beating.' They had saved it, and he, a little ashamed of the smallness of the act, had gone with Hester to the barn, and made a nest for it in the hay." but the wonderful words that he remembered were these. Perhaps some day a little mouse will help you, Jim. Hester had spoken laughingly, and her words had come true. All the time that Faulkner was preparing and eating his breakfast he watched for the mouse, but it did not appear. Then he went to the door. It swung outward, and it took all his weight to force it open. On one side of the cabin the snow was drifted almost to the roof. Ahead of him, he could barely make out the dark shadow of the scrub spruce forest beyond the little clearing he had made. He could hear the spruce tops wailing and twisting in the storm, and the snow and the wind stung his face and half blinded him. It was dark, dark with the gray and maddening gloom that yesterday would have driven him still nearer to the merge of madness. But this morning he laughed as he listened to the wailings in the air and stared out into the ghostly chaos. It was not the thought of his loneliness that came to him now, but the thought that he was safe. The law could not reach him now, even if it knew where he was. And before it began its hunt for him again in the spring, he would be hiking southward, 
to the girl and the baby, and it would still be hunting for him when they three would be making a new life for themselves in some other part of the world. For the first time in months he was almost happy. He closed and bolted the door, and began to whistle. He was amazed at the change in himself, and wonderingly he stared at his reflection in the cracked bit of mirror against the wall. He grinned, and addressed himself aloud. "'You need a shave,' he told himself. "'You'd scare the fits out of anything alive. Now that we've got company, we've got to spruce up and look civilized.' It took him an hour to get rid of his heavy beard. His face looked almost boyish again. He was inspecting himself in the mirror when he heard a sound and turned slowly toward the table. The little mouse was nosing about his tin plate. For a few moments Faulkner watched it, fearing to move. Then he cautiously began to approach the table. "'Hello there, old chap,' he said, trying to make his voice soft and ingratiating. "'Pretty late for breakfast, ain't you?' At his approach the mouse humped itself into a motionless ball and watched him. To Faulkner's delight it did not run away when he reached the table and sat down. He laughed softly. "'You ain't afraid, are you?' he asked. "'We're going to be chums, ain't we?' "'Yes, sir, we're going to be chums.' For a full minute the mouse and the man looked steadily at each other. Then the mouse moved deliberately to a crumb of bannock, and began nibbling at its breakfast. For ten days there was only an occasional lull in the storm that came out of the north. Before those ten days were half over, Jim and the mouse understood each other. The little mouse itself solved the problem of their near acquaintance by running up Faulkner's leg one morning while he was at breakfast and coolly investigating him from the strings of his moccasins to the collar of his blue shirt. After that it showed no fear of him, and a few days later would nestle in the hollow of his hand, and nibble fearlessly at the bannock which Faulkner would offer it. Then Jim took to carrying it about in his coat pocket. That seemed to suit the mouse immensely, and when Jim went to bed nights, or it grew too warm for him in the cabin, he would hang the coat over his bunk, with the mouse still in it, so that it was not long before the little creature made up its mind to take full possession of the pocket. It intimated as much to Faulkner on the tenth and last day of the storm, when it began very businesslike operations of building a nest of paper and rabbit's fur in the coat pocket. Jim's heart gave a big and sudden jump of delight when he saw the work going on. "'Bless my soul! I wonder if it's a girl mouse and we're going to have babies,' he gasped. After that he did not wear the coat, through fear of disturbing the nest. The two became more and more friendly, until finally the mouse would sit on Jim's shoulder at mealtime, and nibble at the bannock. What little trouble the mouse caused only added to Faulkner's love for it. "'He's a human little cuss,' he told himself one day, as he watched the mouse busy at work caching scraps of food, which it carried through a crack in the sapling floor. "'He's that human I've got to put all my grub in tin cans or we'll go short before spring. His chief trouble was keeping his snowshoes out of his tiny companion's reach. The mouse had developed an unholy passion for Babish, the caribou skin thongs used in the webs of his shoes, and one of the webs was half eaten away before Faulkner discovered what was going on. At last he was compelled to suspend the shoes from a nail driven in one of the roof beams. In the evening, when the stove glowed hot, and a cotton wick sputtered in a pan of caribou grease on the table, Faulkner's chief diversion was to tell the mouse all about his plans, and hopes, and what had happened in the past. He took an almost boyish pleasure in these one-sided entertainments, and yet, after all, they were not entirely one-sided, for the mouse would keep its bright, serious-looking little eyes on Faulkner's face. It seemed to understand, if it could not talk. Faulkner loved to tell the little fellow of wonderful days of four or five years ago, away down in the sunny Ohio Valley where he courted the girl, and where they lived before they moved to the farm in Canada. He tried to impress on little Jim's mind what it meant for a great big, unhandsome fellow like himself to be loved by a tender slip of a girl whose hair was like gold, and whose eyes were as blue as the wood violets. One evening he fumbled for a minute under his bunk, and came back to the table with a worn and finger-marked manila envelope, from which he drew tenderly and almost trembling with care a long, shining tress of golden hair. "'That's hers,' he said proudly, placing it on the table close to the mouse. "'And she's got so much of it you can't see her to the hips when she takes it down, and out in the sun it shines like—like—glory.' 
The stove door crashed open, and a number of coals fell out upon the floor. For a few minutes Faulkner was busy, and when he returned to the table he gave a gasp of astonishment. The curl and the mouse were gone. Little Jim had almost reached its nest, with its lovely burden when Faulkner captured it. "'You little cuss,' he breathed. "'Now I know you come from her. I know it.' In the weeks that followed the storm Faulkner again followed his trap lines, and scattered poison baits for the white foxes on the barren. Early in January the second great storm of the year came from out of the north. It gave no warning, and Faulkner was caught ten miles from camp. He was making a struggle for life before he reached the shack. He was exhausted and half-blinded. He could hardly stand on his feet when he staggered up against his own door. He could see nothing when he entered. He stumbled over a stool and fell to the floor. Before he could rise, a strange weight was upon him. He made no resistance, for the storm had driven the last ounce of strength from his body. "'It's been a long chase, but I've got you now, Faulkner,' he heard a triumphant voice say. And then came the dreaded formula, fear to the uttermost limits of the great northern wilderness. "'I warn you, you are my prisoner, in the name of His Majesty the King.' Corporal Carr, of the Royal Mounted of the Northwest, was a man without human sympathies. His face was thin with a square, bony jaw, and lips that formed a straight line. His eyes were greenish, like a cat's, and were constantly shifting. He was a beast of prey, as much as the wolf, the lynx, or the fox, and his prey was men. Only such a man as Carr alone would have braved the treacherous snows and the intense cold of the Arctic winter to run him down. Faulkner knew that, as an hour later he looked over the roaring stove at his captor, about Carr there was something of the unpleasant quickness, the sinuous movement of the white ermine, the outlaw of the wilderness. His eyes were merciless. At times Faulkner caught the same red glint in them. And above his despair, the utter hopelessness of his situation, there rose in him an intense hatred and loathing of the man. Faulkner's hands were then securely tied behind him. "'I'd put the irons on you,' Carr had explained a hard, emotionless voice, only I lost them somewhere back there. Beyond that, he had not said a dozen words. He built up the fire, thawed himself out, and helped himself to food. Now, for the first time, he loosened up a bit. I've had a devil of a chase, he said bitterly, a cold glitter in his eyes as he looked at Faulkner. I've been after you three months, and now I've got you this accursed storm is going to hold me up and I left my dogs and my outfit a mile back in the scrub. "'Better go after them, replied Faulkner. "'If you don't, there won't be any dogs and outfit by morning.' Corporal Carr rose to his feet and went to the window. In a moment he turned. "'I'll do that,' he said. "'Stretch yourself out on the bunk. "'I'll have to lace you down pretty tight to keep you from playing a trick on me.' There was something so merciless and brutal in his eyes and voice that Faulkner felt like leaping upon him even with his hands tied behind his back. He was glad, however, that Carr had decided to go. He was filled with an overwhelming desire to be rid of him, if only for an hour. He went to the bunk and lay down. Corporal Carr approached, pulling a roll of babbage cord from his pocket. "'If you don't mind, you might tie my hands in front instead of behind,' suggested Faulkner. "'It's going to be mighty unpleasant to have him under me if I've got to lay here for an hour or two. "'Not on your life. I won't tie him in front,' snapped Carr, his little eyes glittering. And then he gave a cackling laugh, and his eyes were as green as a cat's. "'And it won't be half as unpleasant as having something around your neck,' he joked. "'I wish I was free,' breathed Faulkner, his chest heaving. "'I wish we could fight man to man. I'd be willing to hang then, just to have a chance to break your neck. You ain't a man of the law. You're a devil.' Carr laughed the sort of laugh that sends a chill up one's back, and drew the caribou-skin cord tight about Faulkner's ankles. "'Can't blame me for being a little careful,' he said in his revolting way. "'By your hanging I become sergeant. That's my reward for running you down.' He lighted the lamp and filled the stove before he left the cabin. From the door he looked back at Faulkner, and his face was not like a man's, but like that of some terrible death spirit, ghostly and thin and exultant in the dim glow of the lamp. As he opened the door, the roar of the blizzard, and a gust of snow filled the cabin. 
Then it closed, and a groaning curse fell from Faulkner's lips. He strained fiercely at the thongs that bound him, but after a few minutes he lay still, breathing hard, knowing that every effort he made only tightened the caribou-skin cord that bound him. On his back he listened to the storm. It was filled with the same strange cries and moaning sounds that had almost driven him to madness, and now they sent through him a shivering chill that he had not felt before, even in the darkest and most hopeless hours of his loneliness and despair. A breath that was almost a sob broke from his lips as a vision of the girl and the kid came to shut out from his ears the moaning tumult of the wind. A few hours before he had been filled with hope, almost happiness, and now he was lost. From such a man as Carr there was no hope for mercy or of escape. Flat on his back he closed his eyes and tried to think, to scheme something that might happen in his favor to foresee an opportunity that might give him one last chance. And then, suddenly, he heard a sound. It traveled over the blanket that formed a pillow for his head. A cool, soft little nose touched his ear, and then tiny feet ran swiftly over his shoulder and halted on his breast. He opened his eyes and stared. "'You little cuss!' he breathed. A hundred times he had spoken those words, and each time they were of increasing wonder and adoration. "'You little cuss!' he whispered again, and chuckled aloud. The mouse was humped on its breast in that curious little ball that it made of itself, and was eyeing him, Jim thought, in a questioning sort of way. "'What's the matter with you?' it seemed to ask. "'Where are your hands?' Jim answered, "'They've got me, old man. Now what the dickens are we going to do?' The mouse began investigating. It examined his shoulder, to the end of his chin, and ran along his arm as far as it could go. "'Now what do you think of that?' Faulkner exclaimed softly. "'The little cuss is wondering where my hands are.' Gently he rolled over on his side. "'There they are,' he said. "'Hitch tightered and barked to a tree.' He wiggled his fingers, and in a moment he felt the mouse. The little creature ran across the open palm of his hand to his wrist, and then every muscle in Faulkner's body grew tense, and one of the strangest cries that ever fell from human lips came from his. The mouse had found once more the dried hide flesh of which the snowshoe webs were made. It had found Babish, and it had begun to gnaw. In the minutes that followed, Faulkner scarcely breathed. He could feel the mouse when it worked. Above the stifled beating of his heart, he could hear its tiny jaws. In those moments, he knew that his last hope of life hung in the balance. Five, ten minutes passed. Not until then did he strain at the thongs that bound his wrists. Was that the bed that snapped, or was it the breaking of one of the babish cords? He strained harder. The thongs were loosening. His wrists were freer. With a cry that sent the mouse scurrying to the floor, he doubled himself half erect and fought like a madman. Five minutes later he was free. He staggered to his feet and looked at his wrists. They were torn and bleeding. His second thought was of Corporal Carr and the weapon. The manhunter had taken the precaution to empty the chambers of Faulkner's revolver and rifle, and throw the cartridges out in the snow. But his skinning knife was still in its sheath and belt, and he buckled it about his waist. He had no thought of killing Carr, though he hated the man almost to the point of murder. But his lips set in a grim smile as he thought of what he would do. He knew that when Carr returned he would not enter at once into the cabin. He was the sort of man who would never take an unnecessary chance. He would go first to the little window and look in. Faulkner turned the lamp wick lower and placed the lamp on the table directly between the window and the bunk. Then he rolled his blankets into something like a human form and went to the window to see the effect. The bunk was in deep shadow. From the window Carr could not see beyond the lamp. Then Faulkner waited, out of range of the window and close to the door. It was not long before he heard something above the wailing of the storm. It was the whine of a dog, and he knew that a moment later the corporal's ghostly face was peering in at the window. Then there came the sudden swift opening of the door, and Carr sprang in like a cat, his hand on the butt of his revolver, still obeying the first governing law of his merciless life, caution. Faulkner was so near that he could reach out and touch Carr, and in an instant he was at his enemy's throat. Not a cry fell from Carr's lips. 
There was death in the terrible grip of Faulkner's hands, and like one whose neck has been broken, Carr sank to the floor. Faulkner's grip tightened, and it did not loosen until Carr was black in the face and his jaw fell open. Then Faulkner bound him hand and foot with the babish thongs, and dragged him to the bunk. Through the open door one of the sledge-dogs had thrust his head and shoulders. It was a barracks team, accustomed to warmth and shelter, and Faulkner had no difficulty in getting the leader and his three mates inside. To make friends with them he fed them chunks of raw caribou meat, and when Carr opened his eyes he was busy packing. He laughed joyously when he saw that the man-hunter had regained consciousness, and was staring at him with evident malice. "'Hello, Carr,' he greeted affably. "'Feeling better? Table sort of turned, ain't they?' Carr made no answer. His white lips were set like thin bands of steel. "'I'm getting ready to leave you,' explained Faulkner, as he rolled up a blanket and shoved it into his rubber pack pouch. "'And you're going to stay here until spring. Do you get on to that? You've got to stay. I'm going to leave you marooned, so to speak. You couldn't travel a hundred yards without snowshoes, and I'm going to take your snowshoes, and I'm going to take your guns, and burn your pack, your coat, mittens, cap, and moccasins. Catch on? I'm not going to kill you, and I'm going to leave you with enough grub to last until spring. But you won't dare risk yourself out in the cold and snow. If you do, you'll freeze off your tootsies, and make your lungs sick. Don't you feel sort of pleasant, you, you devil? Six hours later Faulkner stood outside the cabin. The dogs were in their traces, and the sledge was packed. The storm had blown itself out, and a warmer temperature had followed in the path of the blizzard. He wore his coat now, and gently he felt of the bulging pocket, and laughed joyously as he faced the south. "'It's going to be a long hike, you little cuss,' he said softly. "'It's going to be a darn long hike. But we'll make it. Yes, sir, we'll make it. And won't they be surprised when we fall on them six months ahead of time?' He examined the pocket carefully making sure that he had buttoned down the flap. "'I wouldn't want to lose you,' he chuckled. "'Next to her and the kid, I wouldn't want to lose you.' Then, slowly, a strange smile passed over his face, and he gazed questioningly for a moment at the pocket which he held in his hand. "'You nervy little cuss,' he grinned. "'I wonder if you're a girl mouse, and you're going to have a family on the way home. And, and, what the dickens do you feed baby mice?' He lowered the pocket, and with a sharp command to the waiting dogs, turned his face into the south. End of the Mouse by James Kerwood Read by Rowdy Delaney, Idaho, USA Hour by Kate Chopin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of an Hour by Kate Chopin Knowing that Mrs. Mallard was afflicted with a heart trouble, great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. It was her sister Josephine who told her, in broken sentences, veiled hints that revealed in half-concealing. Her husband's friend Richards was there, too, near her. It was he who had been in the newspaper office when intelligence of the railroad disaster was received, with Brentley Mallard's name leading the list of killed. He had only taken the time to assure himself of its truth by a second telegram, and had hastened to forestall any less careful, less tender friend in bearing the sad message. She did not hear the story as many women have heard the same, with a paralyzed inability to accept its significance. She wept at once, with sudden, wild abandonment in her sister's arms. When the storm of grief had spent itself, she went away to her room alone. She would have no one follow her. There stood, facing the open window, a comfortable, roomy armchair. Into this she sank, pressed down by a physical exhaustion that haunted her body and seemed to reach into her soul. She could see in the open square before her house the tops of trees that were all a-quiver with the new spring life. The delicious breath of rain was in the air. In the street below, a peddler was crying his wares. The notes of a distant song which someone was singing reached her faintly, and the countless sparrows were twittering in the eaves. There were patches of blue sky showing here and there through the clouds that had met and piled one above the other in the west facing her window. 
She sat with her head thrown back upon the cushion of the chair, quite motionless, except when a sob came up into her throat and shook her, as a child who has cried itself to sleep continues to sob in its dreams. She was young, with a fair, calm face, whose lines bespoke repression and even a certain strength. But now there was a dull stare in her eyes, whose gaze were fixed away off yonder on one of the patches of blue sky. It was not a glance of reflection, but rather indicated a suspension of intelligent thought. There was something coming to her, and she was waiting for it, fearfully. What was it? She did not know. It was too subtle and elusive to name. But she felt it creeping out of the sky, reaching toward her through the sounds, the scents, the colors that filled the air. Now her bosom rose and fell tumultuously. She was beginning to recognize this thing that was approaching to possess her, and she was striving to beat it back with her will. As powerless as her two white slender hands would have been, when she abandoned herself, a little whispered word escaped her slightly parted lips. She said it over and over under her breath, free, free, free. The vacant stare and the look of terror that had followed it went from her eyes. They stayed keen and bright. Her pulses beat fast, and the coursing blood warmed and relaxed every inch of her body. She did not stop to ask if it were or were not a monstrous joy that held her. A clear and exalted perception enabled her to dismiss the suggestion as trivial. She knew that she would weep again when she saw his kind, tender hands folded in death, the face that had never looked save with love upon her, fixed and gray and dead. But she saw beyond that bitter moment a long procession of years to come that would belong to her absolutely. And she opened and spread her arms out to them in welcome. There would be no one to live for during the coming years. She would live for herself. There would be no powerful will bending hers into that blind persistence that which men and women believe that they have the right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. A kind intention or a cruel intention made the act seem no less a crime as she looked upon it in that brief moment of illumination. And yet she had loved him, sometimes. Often she had not. What did it matter? What could love, the unsolved mystery, count for in face of this possession of self-assertion which she suddenly recognized as the strongest impulse of her being? Free, body and soul free, she kept whispering. Josephine was kneeling before the closed door with her lips to the keyhole, imploring for admission. Louise, open the door. I beg, open the door. You will make yourself ill. What are you doing, Louise? For heaven's sakes, open the door. Go away. I am not making myself ill. No, she was drinking in the very elixir of life through the open window. Her fancy was running riot along those days ahead of her. Spring days and summer days and all sorts of days that would be her own. She breathed a quick prayer that life might be long. It was only yesterday that she thought with a shudder that life might be long. She rose at length and opened the door to her sister's importunities. There was a feverish triumph in her eyes, and she carried herself unwittingly like the goddess of victory. She clasped her sister's waist, and together they descended the stairs. Richard stood waiting for them at the bottom. Someone was opening the front door with a latch key. It was Brentley Mallard who entered, a little travel-stained, composedly carrying his gripsack and umbrella. He had been far from the scene of the accident and did not even know there had been one. He stood amazed at Josephine's piercing cry, at Richard's quick motion to screen him from the view of his wife. But Richard's was too late. When the doctors came, they said she had died of heart disease, of the joy that kills. End of story of an hour. by Guy de Maupassant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Paul Curran in the hills of northern England. The Model by Guy de Maupassant. Curving like a crescent moon, the little town of Etretat, with its white cliffs, its white shingly beach, and its blue sea, lay in the sunlight at high noon one July day. At either extremity of this crescent, its two gates, the small to the right, the larger one at the left, stretched forth, one a dwarf, and the other a colossal limb, into the water, and the bell tower, almost as tall as the cliff, wide below, narrowing at the top 
raised its pointed summit to the sky. On the sands beside the water, a crowd was seated watching the bathers. On the terrace of the casino, another crowd, seated or walking, displayed beneath the brilliant sky a perfect flower patch of bright costumes, with red and blue parasols embroidered with large flowers in silk. On the walk at the end of the terrace, other persons, the restful, quiet ones, were walking slowly, far from the dressy throng. A young man, well known and celebrated as a painter, Jean Sumner, was walking with a dejected air beside a wheeled chair in which sat a young woman, his wife. A manservant was gently pushing the chair, and the crippled woman was gazing sadly at the brightness of the sky, the gladness of the day, and the happiness of others. They did not speak. They did not look at each other. Let us stop a while, said the young woman. They stopped, and the painter sat down on a camp stool that the servant handed him. Those who were passing behind the silent and motionless couple looked at them compassionately. A whole legend of devotion was attached to them. He had married her in spite of her infirmity, touched by her affection for him, it was said. Not far from there, two young men were chatting, seated on a bench and looking out to the horizon. No, it's not true. I tell you that I am well acquainted with John Sumner. But then... Why did he marry her? For she was a cripple when she married, was she not? Just so. He married her. He married her. Just as everyone marries, Pablo. Because he was an idiot. But why? But why? But why, my friend? There is no why. People do stupid things just because they do stupid things. And besides, you know very well that painters make a speciality of foolish marriages. They almost always marry models, former sweethearts in fact, women of doubtful reputation frequently. Why do they do this? Who can say? One would suppose that constant association with the general run of models would disgust them forever with that class of women. Not at all. After having posed them, they marry them. Read that little book, so true, so cruel and so beautiful, by Alphonse Daudet, Artists' Wives. In the case of the couple you see over there, the accident occurred in a special and remarkable manner. The woman played a frightful comedy, or rather, tragedy. She risked all to win all. Was she sincere? Did she love Jean? Shall we ever know? Who is able to determine precisely how much is put on and how much is real in the actions of a woman? They are always sincere in an eternal mobility of impressions. They are furious, criminal, devoted, admirable, and base in obedience to intangible emotions. They tell lies incessantly without intention, without knowing or understanding why, and in spite of it all are absolutely frank in their feelings and sentiments, which they display by violent, unexpected, incomprehensible, foolish resolutions which overthrow our arguments, our customary poise, and all our selfish plans. The unforeseenness and suddenness of their determinations will always render them undecipherable enigmas as far as we are concerned. We continually ask ourselves, are they sincere? Are they pretending? But, my friend, they are sincere and insincere at one and the same time, because it is their nature to be extremists in both and to be neither one nor the other. See the methods that even the best of them employ to get what they desire. They are complex and simple, these methods. So complex that we can never guess them beforehand, and so simple that after having been victimised we cannot help being astonished and exclaiming, What? Did she make a fool of me so easily as that? And they always succeed, old man. Especially when it is a question of getting married. But this is Sumner's story. The little woman was a model, of course. She posed for him. She was pretty, very stylish looking, and had a divine figure, it seems. He fancied that he loved her with his whole soul. 
that is another strange thing. As soon as one likes a woman, one sincerely believes that they could not get along without her for the rest of their life. One knows that one has felt the same way before, and that disgust invariably succeeded gratification. That in order to pass one's existence side by side with another, there must be not a brutal, physical passion which soon dies out, but a sympathy of soul, temperament, and temper. One should know how to determine in the enchantment to which one is subjected, whether it proceeds from the physical, from a certain sensuous intoxication, or from a deep spiritual charm. Well, he believed himself in love. He made her no end of promises of fidelity and was devoted to her. She was really attractive, gifted with that fashionable flippancy that little Parisians so readily affect. She chattered, babbled made foolish remarks that sounded witty from the manner in which they were uttered. She used graceful gestures, which were calculated to attract a painter's eye. When she raised her arms, when she bent over, when she got into a carriage, when she held out her hand to you, her gestures were perfect and appropriate. For three months, Jean never noticed that, in reality, she was like all other models. He rented a little house for her for the summer at Andresi. I was there one evening, when for the first time doubts came into my friend's mind. As it was a beautiful evening, we thought we would take a stroll along the bank of the river. The moon poured a flood of light over the trembling water, scattering yellow gleams along its ripples, in the currents, and all along the course of the wide, slow river. We strolled along the bank. A little enthused by that vague exaltation that these dreamy evenings produce in us. We would have liked to undertake some wonderful task, to love some unknown, deliciously poetic being. We felt ourselves vibrating with raptures, longings, strange aspirations, and we were silent, our beings pervaded by the serene and living coolness of the beautiful night, the coolness of the moonlight, which seemed to penetrate one's body permeate it, soothe one's spirit, fill it with fragrance and steep it in happiness. Suddenly, Josephine, that is her name, uttered an exclamation. Oh, did you see the big fish that jumped over there? He replied without looking, without thinking. Yes, dear. She was angry. No, you did not see it, for your back was turned. He smiled. Yes, that's true. It is so delightful that I am not thinking of anything. She was silent, but at the end of a minute, she felt as if she must say something and asked, Are you going to Paris tomorrow? I do not know, he replied. She was annoyed again. Do you think it is very amusing to walk along without speaking? People talk when they are not stupid. He did not reply. Then... Feeling with her woman's instinct that she was going to make him angry, she began to sing a popular air that had harassed our ears and our minds for two years. Je regarde en fer. He murmured, Please keep quiet. She replied angrily, Why do you wish me to keep quiet? You'll spoil the landscape for us, he said. Then followed a scene, a hateful, idiotic scene, with unexpected reproaches, unsuitable recriminations, then tears. Nothing was left unsaid. They went back to the house. He had allowed her to talk without replying, enervated by the beauty of the scene and dumbfounded by this storm of abuse. Three months later, he strove wildly to free himself from those invincible and invisible bonds with which such a friendship chains our lives. She kept him under her influence, tyrannizing over him, making his life a burden to him. They quarreled continually, vituperating and finally fighting each other. He wanted to break with her at any cost. He sold all his canvases, borrowed money from his friends, realizing 20,000 francs. He was not well known then and left them for her one morning with a note of farewell. He came and took refuge with me. About three o'clock that afternoon there was a ring at the bell. I went to the door. A woman sprang towards me, pushed me aside, came in and went into my atelier. It was she. 
He had risen when he saw her coming. She threw the envelope containing the banknotes at his feet with a truly noble gesture, and said in a quick tone, "'There's your money. I don't want it.' She was very pale, trembling, and ready undoubtedly to commit any folly. As for him, I saw him grow pale also, pale with rage and exasperation, ready also perhaps to commit any violence. He asked, "'What do you want?' She replied, "'I do not choose to be treated like a common woman. You implore me to accept you. I ask you for nothing. Keep me with you.' He stamped his foot. "'No, that's a little too much. If you think you are going, I'd seized his arm. Keep still, Jean. Let me settle it. I went towards her, and quietly, little by little, I began to reason with her, exhausting all the arguments that are used under similar circumstances. She listened to me, motionless, with a fixed gaze, obstinate and silent. Finally, not knowing what more to say, and seeing that there would be a scene, I thought of a last resort, and said, "'He loves you still, my dear, but his family want him to marry someone, and you understand.' She gave a start and exclaimed, "'Ah! Ah! Now I understand!' And turning toward him, she said, "'You are... you are going to get married?' He replied decidedly, "'Yes.' She took a step forward. "'If you marry, I will kill myself, do you hear?' He shrugged his shoulders and replied, "'Well, then kill yourself.' She stammered out, almost choking with her violent emotion. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Say it again. He repeated, Well, then kill yourself if you like. With her face almost livid, she replied, Do not dare me! I will throw myself from the window! He began to laugh, walked towards the window, opened it, and bowing with the gesture of one who desires to let someone else precede him, he said, this is the way. After you. She looked at him for a second with terrible, wild, staring eyes. Then, taking a run, as if she were going to jump a hedge in the country, she rushed past me and past him, jumped over the sill, and disappeared. I shall never forget the impression made on me by that open window, after I had seen that body pass through it to fall to the ground. It appeared to me in a second to be as large as the heavens, and as hollow as space, and I drew back instinctively, not daring to look at it, as though I feared I might fall out myself. Jean, dumbfounded, stood motionless. They brought the poor girl in with both legs broken. She will never walk again. Jean wild with remorse and also possibly touched with gratitude made up his mind to marry her there you have it old man it was growing dusk the young woman felt chilly and wanted to go home and the servant wheeled the invalid chair in the direction of the village the painter walked beside his wife neither of them having exchanged a word for an hour This story appeared in Le Galois, December 17, 1883. The End of The Model by Guy de Maupassant A Practical Joke by Guy de Maupassant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Robinson A Practical Joke by Guy de Maupassant The jokes that are played nowadays are somewhat dismal. They are not like the inoffensive, laughable jokes of our forefathers. Still, there is nothing more amusing than to play a good joke on someone to force them to laugh at their own foolishness, and if they get angry, to punish them by playing a new joke on them. I have played many a joke in my lifetime, and I have had some played on me, some very good ones, too. I have played some very laughable ones and some terrible ones. 
one of my victims died of the consequences, but it was no loss to anyone. I will tell about it some day, but it will not be an easy task, as the joke was not at all a nice one. It happened in the suburbs of Paris, and those who witnessed it are laughing yet at the recollection of it, though the victim died of it. May he rest in peace. I will narrate two today, one in which I was the victim, and another in which I was the instigator. I will begin with the former, as I do not find it so amusing being the victim myself. I had been invited by some friends in Picardy to come and spend a few weeks. They were fond of a joke like myself. I would not have known them had they been otherwise. They gave me a rousing reception on my arrival. They fired guns, they kissed me, and made such a fuss over me that I became suspicious. Be careful, old fox, I said to myself. There's something up. During dinner, they all laughed immoderately. I thought to myself, they are certainly projecting some good joke and intend to play it on me, for they laugh at nothing, apparently. I was on my guard all evening and looked at everybody suspiciously, even at the servants. When bedtime came, everybody escorted me to my room and bid me good night. I wondered why, and after shutting my door, I stood in the middle of the room with the candle in my hand. I could hear them outside in the hall whisper and laugh. They were watching me, no doubt. I looked at the walls, inspected the furniture, the ceiling, the floor, but I found nothing suspicious. I heard footsteps close to my door. Surely they were looking through the keyhole. Then it struck me that perhaps my light would go out suddenly and I would be left in the dark, so I lighted all the candles and looked around once more. But I discovered nothing. After having inspected the windows and the shutters, I closed the ladder with care, then I drew the curtains and placed a chair against them. If someone should try to come in that way, I would be sure to hear them, I thought. Then I sat down, cautiously. I thought the chair would give way beneath me, but it was solid enough. I did not dare go to bed, but as it was getting late, I realized that I was ridiculous. If they were watching me, as I suppose they were, they certainly must laugh heartily at my uneasiness. So I resolved to go to bed. Having made up my mind, I approached the alcove. The bed looked particularly suspicious to me, and I drew the heavy curtains back, pulled on them, but they held fast. Perhaps a bucket of water is hidden on the top all ready to fall on me, or else the bed may fall apart as soon as I lie on it. I thought. I racked my brain to try and remember all the different jokes I had played on others so as to guess what might be in store for me. I was not going to be caught, not I. Suddenly, an idea struck me which I thought capital. I gently pulled the mattress off the bed, and it came toward me along with the sheets and blankets. I dragged them in the middle of the room near the door and made my bed up again the best way I could, put out all the lights, and felt my way into bed. I laid awake at least another hour, starting at every little sound, but everything seemed quiet. So I at last went to sleep. I must have slept profoundly for some time when suddenly I woke up with a start. Something heavy had fallen on me, and at the same time a hot liquid streamed all over my neck and chest, which made me scream with pain. A terrible noise filled my ears, as if a whole sideboard full of dishes had fallen in them. I was suffocating under the weight. So I reached out my hand to feel the object, and I felt a face, a nose and whiskers. I gave that face a terrible blow with my fist, but instantaneously I received a shower of blows which drove me out of bed in a hurry and out into the hall. To my amazement, I found it was broad daylight and everybody coming up the stairs to find out the cause of the noise. 
what we found was the valet, sprawled out on the bed, struggling among the broken dishes and tray. He had brought me some breakfast, and having encountered my improvised couch, had very unwillingly dropped the breakfast as well as himself on my face. The precautions I had taken to close the shutters and curtains, and to sleep in the middle of the room, had been my undoing. The very thing I had so carefully avoided had happened. They certainly had a good laugh on me that day. The other joke I speak of dates back to my boyhood days. I was spending my vacation at home, as usual, in the old castle in Picardy. I had just finished my second term at college and had been particularly interested in chemistry, and especially in a compound called phosphor de calcium, which, when thrown in water, would catch fire, explode, followed by fumes of an offensive odor. I had brought a few handfuls of this compound with me so as to have fun with it during my vacation. An old lady named Mademoiselle Dufour often visited us. She was a cranky, vindictive, horrid old thing. I do not know why, but somehow she hated me. She misconstrued everything I did or said, and she never missed a chance to tattle about me, the old hag. She wore a wig of beautiful brown hair, although she was more than sixty, and the most ridiculous little caps adorned with pink ribbons. She was well thought of, because she was rich, but I hated her to the bottom of my heart, and I resolved to revenge myself by playing a joke on her. A cousin of mine, who was of the same age as I, was visiting us, and I communicated my plan to him, but my audacity frightened him. One night, when everybody was downstairs, I sneaked into Mademoiselle Dufour's room, secured a <laughs> receptacle into which I deposited a handful of the calcium phosphate, having assured myself beforehand that it was perfectly dry, and ran to the garret to await developments. Pretty soon I heard everybody coming upstairs to bed. I waited until everything was still. Then I came downstairs barefooted, holding my breath, until I came to Mademoiselle de Faure's door and looked at my enemy through the keyhole. She was putting her things away, and having taken her dress off, she donned a white wrapper. She then filled a glass with water, and, putting her whole hand in her mouth as if she were trying to tear her tongue out, she pulled out something pink and white which she deposited in the glass. I was horribly frightened, but soon found it was only her false teeth she had taken out. She then took off her wig, and I perceived a few straggling white hairs on the top of her head. They looked so comical that I almost burst out laughing. She kneeled down to say her prayers, got up, and approached my instrument of vengeance. I waited a while, my heart beating with expectation. Suddenly I heard a slight sound, then a series of explosions. I looked at Mademoiselle Dufour. Her face was a study. She opened her eyes wide, then shut them, then opened them again and looked. The white substance was crackling, exploding at the same time, while a thick white smoke curled up mysteriously toward the ceiling. Perhaps the poor woman thought it was some satanic fireworks, or perhaps that she had been suddenly afflicted with some horrible disease. At all events, she stood there, speechless with fright, her gaze riveted on the supernatural phenomenon. Suddenly she screamed and fell swooning to the floor. I ran to my room, jumped into bed, and closed my eyes, trying to convince myself that I had not left my room and had seen nothing. She is dead, I said to myself. I have killed her. And I listened anxiously to the sound of footsteps. I heard voices and laughter and the next thing I knew my father was soundly boxing my ears. Mademoiselle Dufour was very pale when she came down the next day and she drank glass after glass of water. 
Perhaps she was trying to extinguish the fire which she imagined was in her, although the doctor had assured her that there was no danger. Since then, when anyone speaks of disease in front of her, she sighs and says, Oh, if you only knew, there are such strange diseases. End of A Practical Joke Recording by Michael Robinson, Carbondale, Illinois. A Painful Case From Dubliners By James Joyce This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mr. James Duffy lived in Chapelazoy, because he wished to live as far as possible from the city of which he was a citizen, and because he found all the other suburbs of Dublin mean, modern, and pretentious. He lived in an old sombre house and from his windows he could look into the disused distillery, or upwards along the shallow river on which Dublin is built. The lofty walls of his uncarpeted room were free from pictures. He had himself bought every article of furniture in the room, a black iron bedstead, an iron washstand, four cane chairs, a clothes rack, a coal scuttle, a fender and irons, and a square table on which lay a double desk. A bookcase had been made in an alcove by means of shelves of white wood. The bed was clothed with white bedclothes, and a black and scarlet rug covered the floor. A little hand mirror hung above the washstand, and during the day a white shaded lamp stood as the sole ornament of the mantelpiece. The books on the white wooden shelves were arranged from below upwards, according to bulk. A complete Wordsworth stood at one end of the lowest shelf, and a copy of the Maynooth Catechism, sewn into the cloth cover of a notebook, stood at one end of the top shelf. Writing materials were always on the desk. In the desk lay a manuscript translation of Hauptmann's Michael Kramer, the stage directions of which were written in purple ink and a little sheaf of papers held together by a brass pin. In these sheets a sentence was inscribed from time to time, and in an ironical moment the headline of an advertisement for bile beans had been pasted on to the first sheet. On lifting the lid of the desk a faint fragrance escaped, the fragrance of new cedarwood pencils, or of a bottle of gum or of an overripe apple, which might have been left there and forgotten. Mr. Duffy abhorred anything which betokened physical or mental disorder. A medieval doctor would have called him Saturnine. His face, which carried the entire tale of his years, was of the brown tint of Dublin streets. On his long and rather large head grew dry black hair and a tawny moustache did not quite cover an unamiable mouth. His cheekbones also gave his face a harsh character. But there was no harshness in the eyes, which, looking at the world from under their tawny eyebrows, gave the impression of a man ever alert to greet a redeeming instinct in others, but often disappointed. He lived at a little distance from his body, regarding his own body with doubtful side-glances. He had an odd autobiographical habit which led him to compose in his mind from time to time a short sentence about himself, containing a subject in the third person and a predicate in the past tense. He never gave alms to beggars and walked firmly, carrying a stout hazel. He had been for many years cashier of a private bank in Baggot Street. Every morning he came in from Chapelazoid by tram. At midday he went to Dan Burke's 
and took his lunch, a bottle of lager beer, and a small trayful of arrowroot biscuits. At four o'clock he was set free. He dined at an eating-house in George's Street, where he felt himself safe from the society of Dublin's gilded youth, and where there was a certain plain honesty in the bill of fare. His evenings were spent either before his landlady's piano, or roaming about the outskirts of the city. His liking for Mozart's music brought him sometimes to an opera or a concert. These were the only dissipations of his life. He had neither companions nor friends, church nor creed. He lived his spiritual life without any communion with others, visiting his relatives at Christmas and escorting them to the cemetery when they died. He performed these two social duties for old dignity's sake, but conceded nothing further to the conventions which regulate the civic life. He allowed himself to think that in certain circumstances he would rob his bank, but as these circumstances never arose, his life rolled out evenly. An adventureless tale. One evening he found himself sitting beside two ladies in the rotunda. The house, thinly peopled and silent, gave distressing prophecy of failure. The lady who sat next him looked round at the deserted house once or twice, and then said, "'What a pity there is such a poor house to-night. It's so hard on people to have to sing to empty benches.' He took the remark as an invitation to talk. He was surprised that she seemed so little awkward. While they talked, he tried to fix her permanently in his memory. When he learned that the young girl beside her was her daughter, he judged her to be a year or so younger than himself. Her face, which must have been handsome, had remained intelligent. It was an oval face, with strongly marked features. The eyes were very dark, blue, and steady. Their gaze began with a defiant note, but was confused by what seemed a deliberate swoon of the pupil into the iris, revealing for an instant a temperament of great sensibility. The pupil reasserted itself quickly. This half-disclosed nature fell again under the reign of prudence, and her astrakhan jacket, molding a bosom of certain fullness, struck the note of defiance more definitely. He met her again a few weeks afterwards at a concert in Earlsfort Terrace, and seized the moment when her daughter's attention was diverted to become intimate. She alluded once or twice to her husband, but her tone was not such as to make the allusion a warning. Her name was Mrs. Sinico. Her husband's great-great-grandfather had come from Leghorn. Her husband was captain of a mercantile boat plying between Dublin and Holland, and they had one child. Meeting her a third time by accident, he found courage to make an appointment. She came. This was the first of many meetings. They met always in the evening, and chose the most quiet quarters for their walks together. Mr. Duffy, however, had a distaste for underhand ways, and finding that they were compelled to meet stealthily, he forced her to ask him to her house. Captain Sinico encouraged his visits, thinking that his daughter's hand was in question. He had dismissed his wife so sincerely from his gallantry of pleasures that he did not suspect that anyone else would take an interest in her. As the husband was often away and the daughter out giving music lessons, Mr. Duffy had many opportunities of enjoying the lady's society. Neither he nor she had any such adventure before, and neither was conscious of any incongruity. Little by little he entangled his thoughts with hers. He lent her books, provided her with ideas, shared his intellectual life with her. She listened to all. Sometimes in return for his theories she gave out some fact of her own life. With almost maternal solicitude she urged him to let his nature open to the full. She became his confessor. 
he told her that for some time he had assisted at the meetings of an irish socialist party where he had felt himself a unique figure amidst a score of sombre workmen in a garret lit by an inefficient oil lamp when the party had divided into three sections each under its own leader and in its own garret he had discontinued his attendances the workmen's discussions he said were too timorous the interest they took in the question of wages was inordinate he felt that they were hard-featured realists and they resented an exactitude which was the produce of a leisure not within their reach no social revolution he told her would be likely to strike dublin for some centuries she asked him why he did not write out his thoughts for what he asked her with careful scorn to compete with phrase-mongers incapable of thinking consecutively for sixty seconds to submit himself to the criticisms of an obtuse middle class which entrusted its morality to policemen and its fine arts to the impresarios he went often to her little cottage outside dublin often they spent their evenings alone little by little as their thoughts entangled they spoke of subjects less remote her companionship was like a warm soil about an exotic many times she allowed the dark to fall upon them refraining from lighting the lamp the dark discreet room their isolation the music that still vibrated in their ears united them this union exalted him wore away the rough edges of his character emotionalized his mental life sometimes he caught himself listening to the sound of his own voice he thought that in her eyes he would ascend to an angelical stature and as he attached the fervent nature of his companion more and more closely to him he heard the strange impersonal voice which he recognized as his own insisting on the soul's incurable loneliness we cannot give ourselves it said we are our own the end of these discourses was that one night during which she had shown every sign of unusual excitement mrs sinico caught up his hand passionately and pressed it to her cheek mr duffy was very much surprised her interpretation of his words disillusioned him he did not visit her for a week then he wrote to her asking her to meet him as he did not wish their last interview to be troubled by the influence of their ruined confessional they met in a little cake shop near the park gate it was cold autumn weather but in spite of the cold they wandered up and down the roads of the park for nearly three hours they agreed to break off their intercourse Every bond, he said, is a bond to sorrow. When they came out of the park, they walked in silence towards the tram. But here she began to tremble so violently that, fearing another collapse on her part, he bade her good-bye quickly and left her. A few days later he received a parcel containing his books and music. Four years passed. Mr. Duffy returned to his even way of life. His room still bore witness of the orderliness of his mind. Some new pieces of music encumbered the music stand in the lower room, and on his shelves stood two volumes by Nietzsche. Thus spake Zarathustra and the gay science. He wrote seldom in the sheaf of papers which lay in his desk. One of his sentences written two months after his last interview with mrs sinico read love between man and man is impossible because there must not be sexual intercourse and friendship between man and woman is impossible because there must be sexual intercourse he kept away from concerts lest he should meet her his father died the junior partner of the bank retired and still 
Every morning he went into the city by tram, and every evening walked home from the city, after having dined moderately in George's Street, and read the evening paper for dessert. One evening, as he was about to put a morsel of corned beef and cabbage into his mouth, his hand stopped. His eyes fixed themselves on a paragraph in the evening paper which he had propped against the water carafe. He replaced the morsel of food on his plate and read the paragraph attentively. Then he drank a glass of water, pushed his plate to one side, doubled the paper down before him between his elbows, and read the paragraph over and over again. The cabbage began to deposit a cold white grease on his plate. The girl came over to him to ask was his dinner not properly cooked. He said it was very good, and ate a few mouthfuls of it with difficulty. Then he paid his bill and went out. He walked along quickly through the November twilight, his stout hazel stick striking the ground regularly. The fringe of the buff mail peeping out of a side pocket of his tight reefer overcoat. On the lonely road which leads from the park gate to Chapelazoid, he slackened his pace. His stick struck the ground less emphatically, and his breath, issuing irregularly, almost with a sighing sound, condensed in the wintry air. When he reached his house, he went up at once to his bedroom, and taking the paper from his pocket, read the paragraph again by the failing light of the window. He read it not aloud, but moving his lips as a priest does when he reads the prayers secreto. This was the paragraph. Death of a Lady at Sydney Parade A Painful Case Today at the City of Dublin Hospital, the Deputy Coroner, in the absence of Mr. Leverett, held an inquest on the body of Mrs. Emily Sinico, aged forty-three years, who was killed at Sydney Parade Station yesterday evening. The evidence showed that the deceased lady, while attempting to cross the line, was knocked down by the engine of the ten o'clock slow train from Kingstown, thereby sustaining injuries of the head and right side, which led to her death. James Lennon, driver of the engine, stated that he had been in the employment of the railway company for fifteen years. On hearing the guard's whistle he set the train in motion, and a second or two afterwards brought it to rest in response to loud cries. The train was going slowly. P. Dunn, railway porter, stated that as the train was about to start he observed a woman attempting to cross the lines. He ran towards her and shouted, but before he could reach her she was caught by the buffer of the engine and fell to the ground. A juror. You saw the lady fall? Witness. Yes. Police Sergeant Crowley deposed that when he arrived he found the deceased lying on the platform apparently dead. He had the body taken to the waiting-room pending the arrival of the ambulance. Constable 57E corroborated. Dr. Halpin, assistant house surgeon of the City of Dublin Hospital, stated that the deceased had two lower ribs fractured and had sustained severe contusions of the right shoulder. The right side of the head had been injured in the fall. The injuries were not sufficient to have caused death in a normal person. Death, in his opinion, had been probably due to shock and sudden failure of the heart's action. Mr. H. P. Patterson Finley, on behalf of the railway company, expressed his deep regret at the accident. The company had always taken every precaution to prevent people crossing the lines except by the bridges, both by placing notices at every station and by the use of patent spring gates at level crossings. The deceased had been in the habit of crossing the lines late at night from platform to platform, and in view of certain other circumstances of the case, he did not think the railway officials were to blame. Captain Sinico of Leoville, Sydney Parade, 
husband of the deceased, also gave evidence. He stated that the deceased was his wife. He was not in Dublin at the time of the accident, as he had arrived only that morning from Rotterdam. They had been married for twenty-two years, and had lived happily until about two years ago, when his wife began to be rather intemperate in her habits. Miss Mary Seneco said that of her late mother had been in the habit of going out at night to buy spirits. She, witness, had also tried to reason with her mother, and had induced her to join a league. She was not at home until an hour after the accident. The jury returned a verdict in accordance with the medical evidence, and exonerated Lennon from all blame. The deputy coroner said it was a most painful case, and expressed great sympathy with Captain Sinico and his daughter. He urged on the railway company to take strong measures to prevent the possibility of similar accidents in the future. No blame attached to anyone. Mr. Duffy raised his eyes from the paper, and gazed out of his window on the cheerless evening landscape. The river lay quiet beside the empty distillery, and from time to time a light appeared in some house on the Lucan Road. What an end! The whole narrative of her death revolted him, and it revolted him to think that he had ever spoken to her of what he held sacred. The threadbare phrases, the inane expressions of sympathy, the cautious words of a reporter won over to conceal the details of a commonplace, vulgar death, attacked his stomach. Not merely had she degraded herself, she had degraded him. He saw the squalid tract of her vice, miserable and malodorous, his soul's companion. He thought of the hobbling wretches whom he had seen carrying cans and bottles to be filled by the barman. Just God! What an end! Evidently she had been unfit to live, without any strength of purpose, an easy prey to habits, one of the wrecks on which civilization has been reared. But that she could have sunk so low! Was it possible he had deceived himself so utterly about her? He remembered her outbursts of that night, and interpreted it in a harsher sense than he had ever done. He had no difficulty now in approving of the course he had taken. As the light failed and his memory began to wander, he thought her hand touched his. The shock which had first attacked his stomach was now attacking his nerves. He put on his overcoat and hat quickly and went out. The cold air met him on the threshold. It crept into the sleeves of his coat. When he came to the public house at Chapelizoy Bridge, he went in and ordered a hot punch. The proprietor served him obsequiously, but did not venture to talk. There were five or six working men in the shop, discussing the value of a gentleman's estate in County Kildare. They drank at intervals from their huge pint tumblers, and smoked spitting often on the floor, and sometimes dragging the sawdust over their spits with their heavy boots. Mr. Duffy sat on his stool and gazed at them, without seeing or hearing them. After a while they went out, and he called for another punch. He sat a long time over it. The shop was very quiet. The proprietor sprawled on the counter, reading the Herald and yawning. Now and again a tram was heard swishing along the lonely road outside. As he sat there, living over his life with her and evoking alternately the two images in which he now conceived her, he realized that she was dead, that she had ceased to exist, that she had become a memory. He began to feel ill at ease. He asked himself, what else could he have done? He could not have carried on a comedy of deception with her. He could not have lived with her openly. He had done what seemed to him best. How was he to blame? 
Now that she was gone, he understood how lonely her life must have been, sitting night after night, alone in that room. His life would be lonely, too, until he too died, ceased to exist, became a memory, if anyone remembered him. It was after nine o'clock when he left the shop. The night was cold and gloomy. He entered the park by the first gate and walked along under the gaunt trees. He walked through the bleak alleys where they had walked four years before. She seemed to be near him in the darkness. At moments he seemed to feel her voice touch his ear, her hand touch his. He stood still to listen. Why had he withheld life from her? Why had he sentenced her to death? He felt his moral nature falling to pieces. When he gained the crest of the magazine hill, he halted and looked along the river towards Dublin, the lights of which burned redly and hospitably in the cold night. He looked down the slope and at the base, in the shadow of the wall of the park. He saw some human figures lying. Those venal and furtive loves filled him with despair. He gnawed the rectitude of his life. He felt that he had been outcast from life's feast. One human being had seemed to love him, and he had denied her life and happiness. He had sentenced her to ignominy, a death of shame. He knew that the prostrate creatures down by the wall were watching him and wished him gone. No one wanted him. He was outcast from life's feast. He turned his eyes to the grey gleaming river, winding along towards Dublin. Beyond the river he saw a goods train winding out of Kingsbridge Station, like a worm with a fiery head winding through the darkness, obstinately and laboriously. It passed slowly out of sight, but still he heard in his ears the laborious drone of the engine reiterating the syllables of her name. He turned back the way he had come, the rhythm of the engine pounding in his ears. He began to doubt the reality of what memory told him. He halted under the tree and allowed the rhythm to die away. He could not feel her near him in the darkness, nor her voice touch his ear. He waited for some minutes, listening. He could hear nothing. The night was perfectly silent. He listened again. Perfectly silent. He felt that he was alone. End of A Painful Case by James Joyce Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake This recording is in the public domain. Tomorrow by Eugene O'Neill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Rowdy Delaney, Idaho, USA. Tomorrow by Eugene O'Neill. It was back in my sailor days, in the winter of my great down-and-outness, that all this happened. In those years of wandering, to be broke and on the beach, in some seaport or other of the world, was no new experience, but this had been an unusually long period of inaction even for me. Six months before I had landed in New York, after a voyage from Buenos Aires, as an able seaman on a British tramp. Since that time I had loafed around the waterfront 
eking out an existence on a small allowance for my family, too lazy of body and mind, too indifferent of things in general, to ship to sea again, or do anything else. I shared a small room with another gentleman ranker, Jimmy Anderson, an old friend of mine, over an all-night dive near South Street known as Tommy the Priest's. This is the story of Jimmy, my roommate, and it began on a cold night in the early part of March. I had waited in Tommy the Priest's, hunched up in a chair near the stove in the back of the room, all the late afternoon until long after dark. My nerves were on edge as a result of two days' carouse ensuing on the receipt of my weekly allowance. Now all that money was gone, over the bar, and the next few days gleamed up as a dreary, sober and hungry ordeal which must, barring miracles, be endured patiently or otherwise. Three or four others of the crowd I knew were sitting near me, equally sick and penniless. We stared gloomily before us, in listless attitudes, spitting dejectedly at the glowing paunch of the stove. Every now and then someone would come in, bringing with him a chill of the freezing wind outside. We would all look up hopefully. No, only a stranger. Nothing in the way of hospitality to be expected from him. Close that damn door, we would growl in chorus and huddle closer to the stove, shivering, muttering disappointed curses. In mocking contrast, the crowd at the bar was drinking, singing, arguing in each other's ears with loud, carefree voices. None of them noticed our existence. Surely a bad night for good Samaritans, I thought, and reflected with bitterness that I counted several in that jubilant throng who had eagerly accepted my favors of two nights previous. Now they saw me and nodded, but that was all. Suddenly sick with human ingratitude, I got up out of my chair, and grumbling a surly good night to all, to the others, went out the side door and up the rickety stairs to our room, Jimmy's and mine. The thought of spending a long evening alone in the room seemed intolerable to me. I lit the lamp and glanced around angrily. A fine hole. The two beds took up nearly all the space, but Jimmy had managed to cram in, in front of the window, a small table on which stood a dilapidated typewriter. The typewriter, of course, was broken and wouldn't work. Jimmy was always going to have it fixed. Tomorrow. But then, Jimmy lived in a dream of tomorrow's, and nothing he ever was associated with ever worked. The lamp on the table threw a stream of light through the dirty window, revealing the fire escape outside. Inside, on a shelf along the window sill, a dyspeptic geranium plant sulked in a small red pot. This plant was Jimmy's garden and his joy. Even when he was too sick to wash his own face, he never forgot to water it the first thing after getting up. It goes without saying, the silly thing never bloomed. Nothing that Jimmy loved ever bloomed, but he always hoped. In fact, he was quite sure it would eventually blossom out, in the dawn of some vague tomorrow. For me, it had value only as a symbol of Jimmy's everlasting futility, of his irritating inefficiency. However, at that period in my life, all flowers were yellow primroses, and nothing more, and Jimmy's pet was out of place. I thought, and in the way. Books were piled on the floor against the walls, and what books? Where Jimmy got them, and what for, God only knows. He never read them, except a few pages at haphazard to put him to sleep. Yet there must have been fifty at least cluttering up the room, books about history, about journalism, about economics, books of impossible poetry and incredible prose, written by unknown authors and published by firms that no one had ever heard of. He had a craze for buying them, and never failed, on those days when he was paid for the odd bits of work he did as an occasional stenographer for a theatrical booking firm, to stagger weakly into Tommy's, very drunk, with two or three of these unreadable volumes clutched to his breast, books with titles like A Commentary on the Bulls of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, or God and the Darwinian Theory by John Jones, or sunflowers and other verses by lydia smith think of it i used to grow wild with rage as i watched him showing them to tommy or big john if he was on or to anyone else who would look and listen with all the besotted pride in the world i would think of the drinks and the food 
kippered herring and bread and good Italian cheese, he might have purchased for the price of these dull works, and I would swear to myself to thrash him good and hard if he even dared to speak to me. And then Jimmy would come and lay his idiotic books on my table, and I looked up at him furiously, and there he would stand, wavering a bit, smiling his sweet, good-natured smile, trying to force half his remaining change into my hand, his lonely, wistful eyes watching me, with the appealing look of a lost dog, hungry for an affectionate pat. What could I do but laugh and love him, and show him that I did by a slap on the back, or in some small way or another? It was worth while forgetting all the injuries in the world just to see the light of gratitude shine up in his eyes. This night I'm speaking of, I picked up one of the books in desperation and lay down to read with the lamp at the head of the bed, but I couldn't concentrate. I was too sick in body, brain, and soul to follow even the words. I threw the book aside and lay on my back staring gloomily at the ceiling. The inmate of the room next door, a broken-down telegrapher, the lunger we used to call him, had a violent attack of coughing, which seemed to be tearing his chest to pieces. I shuddered. He used to spit blood in the back room below. In fact, when drunk he was quite proud of this achievement, but he grew terrified at all allusions to consumption, and wildly insisted that he only had bloody bronchitis, and that he was getting better every day. He died soon after in that same room next to ours. Perhaps the treatment was at fault. A quarter and a half of five-cent whiskey a day, and a plate of free soup at noon to eat is hardly a diet conducive to the cure of any disease, not even bloody bronchitis. He coughed and coughed, until, in a frenzy of tortured nerves, I yelled at him, For God's sake, shut up! Then he subsided into a series of groans and querulous, choking complaints. I thought of consumption, the danger of contagion, and remembered that the window ought to be open. But it was too cold. Besides, what was the difference, con or something else, today or tomorrow, it was all the same, the end. What did I care? I had failed, or rather I had never cared enough about it all to want to succeed. I must have dozed, for I came to with a nervous jump to find the lamp sputtering and smoking, and the light growing dimmer every minute. No oil. That fool Jimmy had promised to bring back some. I had given him my last twenty cents, and he had taken the can with him. He was sober, had been for almost a week, was suffering from one of his infrequent and brief efforts at reformation. No, there was no excuse. I cursed him viciously for the greatest imbecile on earth. The lamp was going out. I would have to lie in darkness, or return to the misery of the room downstairs. Just then I recognized his step on the stairs, and a moment later he came in, bringing the oil. I glared at him. "'Where have you been?' I shouted. "'Look at the lamp, you idiot. I'd have been in the dark in another second. Jimmy came forward shrinkingly, a look of deep hurt in his faded blue eyes. He murmured something about office, and stooped down to fill the lamp. Office? I taunted, scornfully. What office? What do you take me for? I've heard that bunk of yours a million times. Jimmy finished filling the lamp and sat down on the side of his bed opposite me. He didn't answer, only stared at me with an irritating sort of compassionate pity. How prim he was sitting there in his black suit, wispy, gray hair combed over his bald spot, his jowly face scraped close, and chalky with too much cheap powder, the vile odor of which filled the room. I noticed for the first time his clean collar, his fresh shirt. He must have been to the Chinaman's and retrieved part of his laundry. That was what he usually did when he had a windfall of a dollar or so from some unexpected source. Never took all his laundry. That would have been too expensive. Just called at the chinks, and changed his shirt and collar. His other articles of clothing he washed himself at the sink in the hallway. I eyed him up and down resentfully. Here was a man who ought always to remain drunk. Sober, he was a respectful nuisance. And his shoes were shined. Why the profound meditation, I ask? You'd think, to look at you, you were sitting up with my corpse. Cheer up. I feel bad enough without your adding to the gloom. That's just it, Art, he began in slow, doleful tones. 
I hate to see you in this condition. You would never feel this way if you'd only, only... He hesitated as he saw my sneer. Only what, I urged. Only stop your hard drinking, he mumbled, avoiding my eyes. This is almost too much, Jimmy. The water wagon is fatal to your sense of humor. After a week's ride you've accumulated more cheap moralizing than an anchorite in all his years of fasting. I'm your friend, he blundered on, and you know it, Art, or I wouldn't say it. And it hurts you more than it does me, I'll bet. Jimmy had the peaked air of the rebuffed but well-intentioned. If that's the way you want to take it. He was staring unhappily at the floor. We were silent for a time. Then he continued with the obstinacy of the reformed turned reformer. I'm your friend, the best friend you've got. His eyes looked up into mine. His glance was timidly questioning. You know that, don't you, Art? All my peevishness vanished in a flash before his woeful sincerity. I reached over and grabbed his hand, his white, pudgy little hand, so in keeping with the rest of him, warm and soft. Of course I know it, Jimmy. Don't be foolish and take what I've said seriously. I've got a full-size grouch against everything tonight. Jimmy brightened up and cleared his throat. He evidently thought my remarks an expression of willingness to serve as an audience for his temperance lecture. Still, he hesitated politely. I know you don't want to listen. I laughed shortly. Go ahead. Shoot. I'm all ears. Then he began. You know the sort of drool, introduced by a sage wag of the head, and the inevitable remark. I've been through it myself, and I know. I won't bore you with it. Coming from Jimmy, it was the last word in absurdity. I tried not to listen, concentrating my mind on the man himself, my nerves soothed by the monotonous flow of his soft-voiced syllables. Yes, he had been through it all. There was no doubt of that. From soup to nuts. What he didn't realize was that none of it had touched him deeply. Forgetful of the last kick, his eyes had always looked up again with the same appealing, timid uncertainty pleading for a caress, fearful of a blow. And life never failed to deal him the expected kick, never a vicious one, more a shove to get him out of the way of a spirited boot at someone who really mattered. Spurned, Jimmy always returned, affectionate, uncomprehending, wagging his tail ingratiatingly, so to speak. The longed-for caress would come, he was sure of it, if not today, then tomorrow. Ah, tomorrow. I looked searchingly at his face, the squat nose, the wistful eyes, the fleshy cheeks hanging down like dewlaps on either side of his weak mouth with its pale, thick lips. The usual marks of dissipation were there, but none of the scars of intense suffering. The whole effect was characterless, unfinished, as if some sculptor at the last moment had suddenly lost interest in his clay model of a face and abandoned his work in disgust. I wondered what Jimmy would do if he ever saw that face in the clear, cruel mirror of truth. Straggle on in the same lost way, no doubt, and cease to have faith in mirrors. Although most of his lecture was being lost on me, I couldn't prevent a chance word now and then from seeping into my consciousness. Wasted youth, your education, ability, a shame, lost opportunity, drink, some nice girl, these words my ears retained against my will and each word had a sting to it. Gradually my feelings of kindness toward Jimmy petered out. I began to hate him for a pestiferous little crank. What right had he to meddle with my sins? Some of the things he was saying were true, but truth, that kind of truth, should be seen and not heard. I was becoming angry enough to shrivel him up with some contemptuous remark about his hypocrisy and the doubtful duration of time he would stay on the wagon when he suddenly digressed from my misdeeds, and began virtuously holding himself up as a horrible example. He began at the beginning, and even though I welcomed the change of subject, I swore inwardly at the prospect of hearing the history of his life all over again. He had told me this tale at least fifty times while in all stages of maudlin drunkenness. Usually he wept, which was sometimes funny and sometimes not, depending upon my own condition. At all events, it would be a novelty to hear his sober version. I might get some facts this time. 
To my surprise, this story seemed to be identical with the others I had been lulled to sleep by on so many nights. Making allowances for the natural exaggeration of one in liquor, there was but little difference. It started with the Anderson estate in Scotland where Jimmy had spent his boyhood. This estate of the family extended over the greater part of a Scotch county, so Jimmy claimed, and he was touchy when anyone seemed skeptical regarding its existence. He loved to dilate on the beauty of the country, the old manor house, the farms, the game park, and all the rest of it. All this heavily mortgaged, he admitted, and he was not in good standing with most of his relatives on the other side, but he declared that there was one aunt, far gone in years, and hoarded wealth, who still treasured his memory, and he promised all the gang in the back room a rare blowout should the old lady pass away in the proper frame of mind. To all this the crowd would listen with an amiable pretense of belief. For all in all, he was Jimmy, and they all swore by him, and a fairy tale like that is no great matter to hold against a man. But here he was, spinning the same yarn in all its details. I looked at him suspiciously. No, he was certainly stone sober. Could there be any truth in it, then? Impossible. I finally concluded that Jimmy, after the fashion of liars, had ended by mistaking his own fabrications for fact. He continued on through his years in Edinburgh University, his graduation with honors, his going into journalism first in Scotland, then in England, afterwards as a correspondent on the continent, and finally his work in South Africa during the Boer War as a representative of some news service. I had never been able to verify any of this except that relating to the Boer War. An old friend of his had once told me that Jimmy did hold a responsible position in South Africa during the war, and had received a large salary. Then that old friend, old friend-like, shook his head gravely and muttered, Too bad, too bad, drink. Whether the rest of Jimmy's life, as related by him, had ever been lived or not hardly mattered, I thought. Undoubtedly he had been well educated, and what is called a gentleman over there. Of course the Anderson estate was a work of fiction, or, at best, a glorified country house. And mind you, Art, up to that time, Jimmy's story had reached the point where he was at the front in South Africa for the news service company. I never touched a drop except a glass of wine with dinner now and again. That was ten years ago, and I was thirty-five. Then something happened. Ten years, he repeated sadly, and now look where I am. He stared despondently before him for a moment, then brightened up and squared his bent shoulders. But that's all past and gone, and now I'm through with this kind of life for good and all. There's always tomorrow, I ventured ironically. Yes, and I'm going to make the most of it. His eyes were bright with the dreams of a new hope, or rather, the old hope eternally redreamed. He glanced at the table. I'll have to have that typewriter fixed up. Tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow, if I can spare the time. He hadn't noticed my sarcasm. Why, is your day all taken up? I asked, marveling at his imagination. Pretty well so. He put on an air of importance. I saw Edwards today. Edwards was a friend of his who had risen to be editor on one of the big morning papers and he's found an opening for me, a real opening which will give me the opportunity to show them all I'm still in the race. And you start tomorrow? I was dumbfounded. Yes, in the afternoon. His face was alive with energy. Oh, I'll show them all, Art, that I'm still one of the best when I want to be. They've sneered at me long enough. Then you really are about to become a wage slave. I simply couldn't believe it. Honestly, Art, tomorrow... Do you think I'm spoofing you about it? I must admit you seem to be confessing the shameless truth. Well, at any rate, you seem to be pleased, so... Here I jumped up and pumped his hand up and down. A million congratulations, Jimmy, old scout. Jimmy's joy was good to see. There were tears in his eyes as he thanked me. Good old Jimmy. It took him quite a while to get over his emotion. Then, as if he had suddenly remembered something, he began hurriedly fumbling through all his pockets. I must have lost it, he said finally, giving up the search. I wanted to show it to you. What? A letter I received today from Aunt Mary. 
Aunt Mary was the elderly relative in whose will Jimmy hoped to be remembered. She complains of having felt very feeble over the past half year. She appears to be entirely ignorant of my present condition, thank God. Writes that I'm to come and pay her a long visit, should I decide to take a trip abroad this spring. Fancy! And you've lost the letter, I ask, trying to hide my skepticism? Yes. Was showing it to Edwards. Must have dropped on the floor. Or else he— Jimmy stopped abruptly. I think he must have sensed my amused incredulity, for he seemed very put out at something, and didn't look at me. I do hope the poor old lady isn't seriously ill, he murmured after a pause. What? I laughed. Have you the face to tell me that, when you know you've been looking forward to her timely taking off ever since I've known you? Jimmy's face grew red, and he stammered confusedly. He knew he'd said such things that might have sounded that way when he'd been drinking. It was the whiskey talking, and he didn't mean it. Really, he liked her a lot. He remembered she'd been very kind to him when he was a lad. He had hardly seen her since then, twenty-five years ago. No, money or no money, he wanted her to live to be a hundred. But you've told me she's almost ninety now, isn't she? Yes, eighty-six, I think. Then, I said with finality, she's over-lingered her welcome, and you're a simpleton to be wasting your crocodile tears. In advance at that. Besides, I've never noticed her sending any of her vast fortune. She might at least have made you a present once in a while if she cared to earn any regrets over her demise. I've never written her about my hard luck. I hardly ever wrote her, Jimmy said slowly. His tones were ridiculously dismal, and he sat holding his face in his hands, in the woe-begone attitude of a mourner. Well, you should have written. A sudden thought made me smile. What will the bunch in the back room say when they hear this? You may give them that long-promised blowout. Tomorrow, I added maliciously. Jimmy stirred uneasily, and turned on me a glance full of dim suspicion. Why do you keep repeating that word tomorrow? You've said it now a dozen times. Because tomorrow is your day, Jimmy. I answered carelessly. Doesn't your career as a sober, industrious citizen begin then? Oh, he sighed with relief. I thought. He walked up and down in the narrow space between the beds, his hands deep in his pockets. Finally, he stopped and stood beside me. There was an exultant ring in his voice. Ah, I tell you, Art, it's great to feel like a man again, to know you're done for good and all with that mess downstairs. After a pause, he went on in a coaxing, motherly tone. Don't you think you ought to go to work and do something? I hate to see you like this. You know what a pal I am, Art. You can listen to me. It's a shame for you to let yourself go to seed this way. Really, Art, I mean it. Now, Jimmy, I got up and put my hands on his shoulders. I say it without any hard feeling, but I've had about enough of your reform movement for one night. It'll be more truly charitable of you to offer me the price of a drink, if you have it. Your day of reformation is none so remote that you can't realize from experience how rotten I feel. I can hear polar bears baying at the northern lights. Jimmy sighed disconsolately, and dug some small change out of his pocket. I borrowed a dollar from Edwards, he explained. I'll pay him back out of my first salary. The self-sufficient pride he put in that word, salary. But his financial aid proved to be unnecessary. As I was about to take half his change, there was a great trampling from the stairs outside. Our door was kicked open with a bang, and Lyons, the stoker, and Patty Meehan, the old deep-water sailor, came crowding into the room. Lyons was in the first jovial frenzy of drink, but poor Patty was already awash and rapidly sinking. They had been paid off that afternoon, after a trip across on the American liner St. Paul. "'Hello, Lyons. Hello, Patty. Jimmy and I hailed them in pleased chorus. "'Hello yourself!' Lyons crushed Jimmy's hand in one huge paw and patted me affectionately on the back with the other. The jar of it nearly knocked me off my feet, but I managed to smile. Lyons and I were old pals. I had once made a trip as a sailor on the Philadelphia, when he was in her stokehold, and we had become great friends through a chance adventure together ashore in Southampton, which is another story. He stood grinning, swaying a bit in the lamplight, a great, hard bulk of a man, dwarfing the proportions of our little room. Patty lurched over to one of the beds and fell on it. Thick weather, 
thick weather, he groaned to himself, and started singing an old chanty in a thin, quavering nasal whine. A roving, a roving, since roving's been my ruin, no more I'll go a roving with you, fair maid. Shut up, roared Lyons, and turned to me again. Art, how are ye? I dodged an attempt at another love tap, and replied that I was well but thirsty. Thirsty, is it? Do you hear that, Patty, ye slimy Corconian? Here's a mate complaining of thirst, and we would a full payday in our pockets. He pulled out a roll of bills and flaunted them before me with a splendid, spendthrift gesture. Oh, whiskey killed my old poor dad. Whiskey, oh, Johnny, caroled Patty deloriously. Listen to him, Lyons reached out and shook him vigorously. That's the trouble with all them deck scrubbers, the loik of em. They can't stand up to their drink like men. Wake up, Patty. We'll be going below. He hauled Patty to his feet and held him there. Come on, Art. There's some of the boys ye you know below waitin'. You'll have all the drink ye you can pour down your throat, and welcome, and anything more you're wishful for you've but to name. Come on, Jimmy, you're one of us. I've got something to do before I go down. I'll join you in a few minutes, Jimmy replied, wisely evading a direct refusal. See that you do, me sonny boy, warned Lyons, pushing Patty to the door. I turned to Jimmy as I was going out. Well, Good luck till tomorrow, Jimmy, if I don't see you before then. Thank you, Art, he murmured huskily, and shook my hand. I started down. From the bottom of the flight below I heard Lyons' rough curses and Patty wailing lugubriously. Old Joe is dead and gone to hell. Poor old Joe. You'll be in hell yourself if you fall in this black hole, Lyons cautioned, steering him to the top of the second flight as I caught up with them. The fiesta, which began with our arrival in the bar, didn't break up until long after daylight the next morning. It was one of the old, lusty debauches of my sailor days. Songs of the sea and yarns about ships punctuated by rounds of drinks. The last I remember was Lyons bawling out for someone to come down to the docks and to strip him and to see which was the better man. Have a bit of fun with him, was the way he put it. I believe I was Dutch courageous enough to accept his challenge, but he pushed me back in my chair with a warning to be a good boy, or I'd get a spanking. So the party had no fatal ending. As you can well imagine, I slept like a corpse all the next day, and didn't witness Jimmy's departure for the long, hard climb back to respectability and the man who was. When he came home that night he appeared very elated, full of the dignity of labor, tremendously conscious of his position in life provokingly solicitous concerning my welfare. It would have been insufferable in anyone else. But Jimmy, well, Jimmy was Jimmy, and the most lovable chap on earth. You couldn't stay mad at him for more than a minute, if you had the slightest sense of humor. Had he toiled and spun much on his first day, I asked him? No, he admitted after a moment's hesitation. He had spent the time mostly in feeling about, getting the hang of his work, now tomorrow he'd get the typewriter fixed so he could do Sunday special stuff in his spare moments. Stories of what he'd seen in South Africa, and things of that kind. Wasn't that a bully idea? I agreed it was, and retreated to the gang below who were still celebrating, leaving Jimmy with pencil poised over a blank sheet of paper, determined to map out one of his stories then and there. I didn't see him the next day or the day after. I was touring the waterfront with Lyons and Patty and never returned to the room. The fourth day of his job I ran into him for a second in the hallway. He said hello in a hurried tone and brushed past me. For my part, I was glad he didn't stop. I felt he'd immediately start on a heart-to-heart -heart talk which I was in no mood to hear. Later on I remembered his manner had been strange and that he looked drawn and fagged out. The fifth day Patty and Lyons were both broke, but I collected my puny allowance and we sat at a table in the back room squandering it lingeringly on enormous scoops of lager and porter which were filling and lasted a long time. We were still sitting there talking when Jimmy came back from work. He looked in from the hallway, saw us and nodded, but went on upstairs without speaking. "'What's the matter with Jimmy?' grumbled Lyons. "'Can't he speak to a man?' "'He looks like he's sick,' said Patty. Go up, Art. That's a good lad. And ask him if he won't take a bit of drink, maybe. I'll go, I said, getting up. 
but he won't drink anything. Jimmy's strictly temperance these days. He's more likely to give us all a sermon on our sins. Divil take him, then, growled Lyons. But run and get him all the same. He looks like he's been drawn through a crack in the wall. I ran quickly up the stairs and opened the door to our room. Jimmy was sitting on the side of his bed, his head in his hands. I glanced at the typewriter. The keys were still gray with a layer of long accumulated dust. Benny hadn't had it fixed. The same old tomorrow, I thought to myself. Jimmy, I called to him. He jumped to his feet with a frightened start. When he saw who it was, a flush of anger came over his face. "'Why don't you scare the life out of a man?' he said irritably. I was astonished. I'd never known him to flare up like this over a trifle. "'Come down and join us for a while. You don't have to drink, you know. You look done up. What's the trouble? Been working too hard?' He winced at this last remark, as if I'd shaken my fist in his face. Then he made a frantic gesture with his arms, as though he were pushing me out of the room. "'Go! Go back!' His voice was unnaturally shrill. "'Leave me alone! I want to be alone!' "'Jimmy!' I went to him in genuine alarm. "'What's the matter? Anything wrong?' He pressed my hand and tried a feeble attempt at a smile. There were dark rings under his eyes, and, somehow, in some indefinable manner, he seemed years older, a broken man. "'No, Art. I'm all right. Don't mind me. I've a splitting headache. Don't be a fool and let them work you to death. He raised his hands as if he were going to clap them over his ears to shut out my words. Leave me alone, Art, will you? I'm going to bed, he stammered. Right oh, that's the stuff. Get some sleep and you'll be okay. I went downstairs slowly, vaguely worried about him, wondering what the trouble could be. In the end, I laid his peculiar actions to the struggle he was having with his craving for drink. Patty and Lyons agreed with this opinion, and called him a game little swine for sticking to his guns, and as such we toasted him in our lager and porter. When I went up to the room to turn in he was asleep, or pretending to be, I was careful not to disturb him. The next morning I heard him moving about, but as soon as he saw I was awake he appeared in a nervous flurry to get away and we didn't speak more than a few words to each other. That night he never came home at all. I went to bed early, every one was broke, and there was nothing else to do, and when I was aroused out of my slumber by the sun shining on my face through the dirty window, I saw that his bed hadn't been touched. A somber presentment of evil seemed to hover around that bed. The white spread, threadbare and full of holes which he had tucked in with such precise neatness, had the suggestion of a shroud about it, a shroud symbolically woven for one whose life had been threadbare and full of holes. I tried to laugh at such grim imaginings. Jimmy had stayed with Edwards, or someone else from his paper. What was strange in that? This wasn't the first time he'd remained away all night, was it? If I was to give way to such worries, I might just as well put on skirts and be done with it. But my phantoms, however foolish, refused to be laid. I got dressed in a hurry, anxious to escape from this room, bright with sunlight, dark with uncanny threat. Before I went down, struck by a sentimental mood, I got some water from the sink in the hallway, and poured it on his ridiculous geranium plant. After a breakfast of soup, I walked with Patty and Lyons down to the battery. We spent the afternoon there, lounging on one of the beaches. It was a warm day in spring, and we sat blinking at the sunshine, drowsily listening to each other's yarns about the sea, and lazily watching the passing ships. When the sun went down, we returned to Tommy the Priest's. On the way back, I remembered this was Jimmy's payday, and wondered if he would show up. He owed me some money which I hoped would be forthcoming. Otherwise the night was liable to prove an uneventful one and a farewell bust-up was imperative, because Patty and Lyons would be going on board ship the following day if they wanted to make the next trip. The evening didn't pass off as dully as we had feared. Old MacDonald, the printer, was in a festive mood and invited us to join him. Two of the telegraph operators, out of a job at that time, had borrowed some money somewhere and were anxious to return the many treats they had received from us in the past. So the time whiled away very pleasantly. It was shortly after midnight when Jimmy came in. 
As soon as I saw his face I knew that something had happened to him, something very serious. He was incredibly haggard and pale, and there were deep lines of suffering about his mouth and eyes. His eyes, I can't describe them. There was nothing behind them. He nodded and took his place at the bar beside us. Then he spoke, asked us what we'd have in a strained, forced voice, as though it cost him a tremendous effort to talk. He took whiskey himself, poured out the glass brim full, and downed it straight. Big John changed a bill for him, and without looking at me, he held out the couple of dollars he owed me. I put them in my pocket. Jimmy motioned to Big John and called for another round. A spell of silence was on the whole bar room. Everyone there knew him well. They had all joked with him during the week about his being on the wagon, but had secretly admired his firmness of will. Now they stared at him with genuine regret that he should have fallen. Their faces grew sad. They had done the same thing themselves so many times. They understood. Jimmy! He caught the reproach in my voice, and turned to me with a twisted smile. It doesn't matter, he said. Nothing matters. His voice became harsh. Don't forget what you said about my lectures and start in yourself. He immediately felt sorry for having said this. No, Art, I didn't mean that. Never mind what I say. I'm upset about something. Tell me what it is, Jimmy. Maybe I can help. Help? He laughed hysterically. No, no help, please. After all, why shouldn't I tell you? You're bound to find out sooner or later. They'll all know it. He indicated the others who, feeling that Jimmy wanted to be alone with me, had taken their drinks to the table at the rear and were sitting around talking in low, constrained voices. Jimmy blurted out, My job, Art, is gone to hell. What? I pretended more astonishment than I felt. I had guessed that was the trouble. Yes, they asked me to quit. Politely requested. Edwards was very nice about it, very kind, very charitable. He put all the bitterness of his heart into these last words. The rotten swine! Oh no, Art, it wasn't his fault. If they hadn't fired me, I'd have had to resign anyway. I, I couldn't do the work. That's all nonsense, Jimmy. Well, cheer up. All said and done, it's only a job the less. You can always get another for the asking. He looked at me with a sort of wild scorn in his eyes. Can't you understand any better than that? What do I care for the job itself? It isn't that. I tell you, I couldn't do the work. I tried and tried. What I wrote was rot. I couldn't get any news. No initiative, no imagination, no character, no courage. All gone. Nothing left. Not even cleverness. No memory, even. He stopped, breathing hard, the perspiration glistening on his forehead. It came to me gradually, the realization. I couldn't believe it. I had been so sure of myself all these years. All I needed was a chance. It had been so easy for me in the past, long ago. These last few days I've guessed the truth. I've been going crazy. Last night I walked, walked and walked, thinking, and finally, I knew. He paused, choking back a sob his face twitching convulsively with the effort he made to control himself. Then he uttered a cracked sound intended for a laugh. I'm done. Burnt out. Wasted. It's time to dump the garbage. Nothing here. He tapped his head with a silly gesture and laughed again. I began to be afraid he really was going mad. No, Art. It isn't the job that's lost. I'm lost. Now you're talking like a fool. I spoke roughly, trying to shake him out of this mood. I won't talk any more, he said quite calmly. Don't worry. I'm all shot to pieces. No sleep. He broke down, and suddenly turned away from me. But it's hell, Art, to realize all at once. You're dead. I put my arm around his shoulders. Have a drink, Jimmy. Hey, you. John, a little service. What else was there to do? Life had jammed the clear, cruel mirror in front of his eyes, and he had recognized himself in that pitiful thing he saw. "'Have a drink, Jimmy, and forget it. Take a real drink,' I urged. What else was there to do? After we had had a couple at the bar, Jimmy filling his glass to the brim each time, I led him back, and we sat down at the table with the crowd. 
More drinks were immediately forthcoming, and it wasn't long before Jimmy was very drunk. He didn't say anything, but his eyes glazed. His lips drooped loosely. His head wagged uncertainly from side to side. I saw he had had enough, and I hoped his tired brain had been numbed to a forgetful oblivion. Come on to bed, Jimmy. I shook him by the arm. He stared at me vacantly. Bed. Yes, sleep. Sleep, he mumbled, and came with me willing enough. I helped him up the stairs to the room and lit the lamp. He sat on the side of the bed, swaying, unlacing his shoes with difficulty. Presently he began to weep softly to himself. It's you, Alice. Cause of all this. Damn you. No. Didn't mean that. Beg pardon, he muttered. He lifted his head and saw me sitting on the other bed. One word of advice, Art. Never get married. All rotten. All of them. This was something new. What do you know about marriage? I asked curiously. Nothing from experience, surely. He winked at me with drunken cunning. Don't I, though? Not half. Never told you that. What? Never told you what happened. Cape Town? No, you never did. What was it? Might swell tell, Art. Best friend. Tell you everything tonight. All over. Yes. Married in England, English girl, pretty's picture, big blue eyes, just before war, took her South Africa with me, and left her in Cape Town when I went to front. I was called back to Cape Town suddenly, found her with staff officer, dirty swine, no chance for doubt, didn't expect me to turn up, saw him with my own eyes, flagrante delicto, you know. Dirty swine of a staff officer. Goodbye, Jimmy Anderson. All over. Drink, drink, forget. He blubbered to himself, his face a grotesque mask of tragedy. In a flash, it came back to me how he'd always stopped in the stories of his life at the point where he'd commenced drinking. Even at his drunkest, he'd always ended the history there by saying abruptly, and then something happened. I'd never attached much importance to it. Thought he merely wanted to suggest a mysterious reason as an excuse for his tobogganing. Now I knew. Who could doubt the truth of his statements, knowing all he had been through that day? He was in a mood for truth. So this was something which happened. Here was a real tragedy. Real tragedy. And there he was, sobbing, hiccuping, rolling his eyes stupidly, scratching with limp fingers at tears which ran down and tickled the sides of his nose. I felt a mad desire to laugh. I suppose you and she were divorced, I asked after a pause. No, I couldn't. No proof. No money. Besides, what'd I care about divorce? Never want to marry again. Never love anyone else. He wept more violently than ever. But didn't she get a divorce? No, she's too cute for that. Thinks Aunt Mary'll leave me money, and I'll drink myself to death. No. He interrupted himself hastily. Can't be that. Not s bad as that. Not Alice. No, no. Mustn't say that. Not right for me to say that. Don't know her reason. Never can tell about women. Damn shoes. He gave up his attempt to get his shoes off and flung himself on the bed, fully dressed. In a minute he was dead to the world and snoring. I left him and went downstairs. Most of the people in the back room were asleep. But Patty and Lyons and the operators were still drinking at one table, and I sat down with them. I talked at random on every subject that came up, seeking to forget Jimmy and his woes for a time at least. His two confessions that night had got on my nerves. Later I must have dozed, for I was jolted out of a half dream by a sharp cracking smash in the back yard. Everyone was awake and cursing in an instant. Big John appeared from behind the curtain, grumbling. Dot's right. Leave bottle on the fire escape, you fellers. Dot's right. And I have to sweep it up. We heard someone racing down the stairs, and Jimmy burst into the room. His face was livid, his eyes popping out of his head. He rushed to the chair beside me and sat down, shaking, his teeth chattering as if he had a chill. I told Big John to bring him a drink. What's the trouble now, Jimmy? I asked when he had calmed down a little. 
He appeared to be quite sober after his sleep. The geranium, he began, his lips trembling, his eyes filling up. So that's what fell down just now, is it? Yes. I woke up and remembered I'd forgotten to water it. I got up and went to get the water. The window was open. I must have stumbled or something. I put out my hand to steady myself. It was so dark I couldn't see. I knocked it out onto the fire escape. Then I heard it crash in the yard. He put his hands over his face and cried heartbrokenly like a sick child whose only remaining toy has been smashed. Not drunken tears this time, but real tears which made all of us at the table blink our eyes and swear fiercely at nothing. After a while he grew quiet again, attempted to smile, ask our pardons for having created a foolish scene. He stared at his drink, standing untouched on the table in front of him, but he never made any motion to take it, didn't seem to realize what it was. For fully fifteen minutes he sat and stared, as still as a stone, never moving his eyes, never even seeming to breathe. Then he got up from his chair and walked slowly to the door like a man in a trance. As he was going out he turned to me and said, I'm tired, Art. I think I'll go to sleep, and something like a wan smile trembled on his pale lips. He left the door open behind him, and I heard him climbing the stairs, and the slam of our door as he closed it behind him. A buzz of conversation broke out, as if his going had lifted a weight of silence off the room full of men. Then it happened. A swish, a sickish thud, as of a heavy rock dropping into thick mud. We looked wildly at one another. We knew. We rushed into the hall and out into the yard. There it was, a motionless, dark huddle of clothes, a splintered, protruding bone or two, a widening pool of blood black against the gray flags. Jimmy. The sky was pale with the light of dawn. Tomorrow had come. The End of Tomorrow by Eugene O'Neill Read by Rowdy Delaney, Idaho, USA In Russia by Saki. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This was recorded by Christopher Hart on January 20th, 2008, in Ottawa, Ontario. Reginald in Russia by Saki. Reginald sat in a corner of the princess's salon and tried to forgive the furniture, which started out with an obvious intention of being Louis Quinze, but relapsed at frequent intervals into Wilhelm II. He classified the princess with that distinct type of woman that looks as if it habitually went out to feed hens in the rain. Her name was Olga. She kept what she hoped and believed to be a fox terrier and professed what she thought were socialist opinions. It is not necessary to be called Olga if you are a Russian princess. In fact, Reginald knew quite a number who were called Vera, but the fox terrier and the socialism are essential. The Countess Lomsham keeps a bulldog, said the princess suddenly. In England, is it more chic to have a bulldog than a fox terrier? Reginald threw his mind back over the canine fashions of the last ten years and gave an evasive answer. Do you think her handsome, the Countess Lomshen? asked the princess. Reginald thought the countess's complexion suggested an exclusive diet of macaroons and pale sherry. He said so. But that cannot be possible, said the princess triumphantly. I've seen her eating fish soup at Danon's. The princess always defended a friend's complexion if it was really bad. With her, as with a great many of her sex, charity began at homeliness and did not generally progress much farther. Reginald withdrew his macaroon and sherry theory and became interested in a case of miniatures. That, said the princess, that is the old princess Lorikoff. She lived in Milonaya Street near the Winter Palace and was one of the court ladies of the old Russian school. Her knowledge of people at events was extremely limited, but she used to patronize everyone who came in contact with her. There was a story that when she died and left the Milanoia for heaven, she addressed St. Peter in her formal staccato French. Je suis la princesse Lorikoff. Il me donne grand plaisir à faire votre connaissance. 
Je vous en prie me présenter au bon Dieu. Saint Peter made the desired introduction, and the princess addressed le bon Dieu. Je suis la princesse Lodikoff. Il me donne grand plaisir à faire votre connaissance. On a souvent parlé de vous à l'église de la rue Million. Only the old and the clergy of established churches know how to be flippant gracefully, commented Reginald. Which reminds me that in the Anglican church in a certain foreign capital, we shall be nameless. I was present the other day when one of the junior chaplains was preaching in aid of distressed somethings or other, and he brought a really eloquent passage to a close with the remark, The tears of the afflicted, to what shall I liken them? To diamonds? The other junior chaplain, who had been dozing out of professional jealousy, awoke with a start and asked hurriedly, Shall I play to diamonds, partner? It didn't improve matters when the senior chaplain remarked dreamily, but with painful distinctness, double diamonds. Everyone looked at the preacher, half expecting him to redouble, but he contented himself with scoring what points he could under the circumstances. You English are always so frivolous, said the princess. In Russia we have too many troubles to permit of our being light-hearted. Reginald gave a delicate shiver, such as an Italian greyhound might give in contemplating the approach of an ice age of which he personally disapproved, and resigned himself to the inevitable political discussion. Nothing that you hear about us in England is true, was the princess's hopeful beginning. I always refused to learn Russian geography at school, observed Reginald. I was certain some of the names must be wrong. Everything is wrong with our system of government, continued the princess placidly. The bureaucrats think only of their pockets, and the people are exploited and plundered in every direction, and everything is mismanaged. With us, said Reginald, a cabinet usually gets the credit of being depraved and worthless beyond the bounds of human conception by the time it has been in office about four years. But if it is a bad government, you can turn it out at the election, argued the princess. As far as I remember, we generally do, said Reginald. But here it is dreadful. Everyone goes to such extremes. In England, you never go to extremes. We go to the Albert Hall, explained Reginald. There is always a seesaw with us between a repression and violence, continued the princess, and the pity of it is the people are really not in the least inclined to be anything but peaceable. Nowhere will you find people more good-natured or family circles where there is more affection. There I agree with you, said Reginald. I know a boy who lives somewhere on the French Quay who is a case in point. His hair curls naturally, especially on Sundays, and he plays bridge well, even for a Russian, which is saying much. I don't think he has any other accomplishments, but his family affection is really of a very high order. When his maternal grandmother died, he didn't go as far as to give up bridge altogether, but he declared on nothing but black suits for the next three months. That, I think, was really beautiful. The princess was not impressed. I think you must be very self-indulgent and live only for amusement, she said. A life of pleasure-seeking and card-playing and dissipation brings only dissatisfaction. You will find that out some day. Oh, I know it turns out that way sometimes, assented Reginald. Forbidden fizz is often the sweetest. But the remark was wasted on the princess, who preferred champagne that had at least a suggestion of dissolved barley sugar. I hope he will come and see me again, she said in a tone that prevented the hope from becoming too infectious, adding as a happy afterthought, you must come to stay with us in the country. Her particular part of the country was a few hundred versts the other side of Tamboff with some fifteen miles of agrarian disturbance between her and the nearest neighbor. Reginald felt that there is some privacy which should be sacred from intrusion. End of Reginald in Russia by Saki The Black Poodle by F. Amstey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. The Black Poodle by F. Anstey. I have set myself the task of relating, in the course of this story, without suppressing or altering a single detail, the most painful and humiliating episode in my life. I do this not because it will give me the least pleasure, but simply because it affords me an opportunity of extenuating myself which has hitherto been wholly denied to me. As a general rule, I am quite aware that to publish a lengthy explanation of one's conduct in any questionable transaction 
is not the best means of recovering a lost reputation. But in my own case, there is one to whom I shall never more be permitted to justify myself by word of mouth, even if I found myself able to attempt it. And, as she could not possibly think worse of me than she does at present, I write this, knowing it can do me no harm, and faintly hoping that it may come to her notice and suggest a doubt whether I am quite so unscrupulous a villain, so consummate a hypocrite, as I have been forced to appear in her eyes. The bare chance of such a result makes me perfectly indifferent to all else. I cheerfully expose to the derision of the whole reading world the story of my weakness and my shame, since by doing so I may possibly rehabilitate myself somewhat in the good opinion of one person. Having said so much, I will begin my confession without further delay. My name is Algernon Weatherhead, and I may add that I am in one of the government departments, that I am an only son, and live at home with my mother. We had had a house at Hammersmith until just before the period covered by this story, when, our lease expiring, my mother decided that my health required country air at the close of the day, and so we took a desirable villa residence on one of the many new building estates which have lately sprung up in such profusion in the home counties. We have called it Wisteria Villa. It is a pretty little place, the last of a row of detached villas, each with its tiny rustic carriage gate and gravel sweep in front, and lawn enough for a tennis court behind, which lines the road leading over the hill to the railway station. I could certainly have wished that our landlord, shortly after giving us the agreement, could have found some other place to hang himself in than one of our attics, for the consequence was that a housemaid left us in violent hysterics about every two months, having learnt the tragedy from the tradespeople, and naturally seen a something immediately afterwards. Still, it is a pleasant house, and I can now almost forgive the landlord for what I shall always consider an act of gross selfishness on his part. In the country, even so near town, a next-door neighbor is something more than a mere numeral. He is a possible acquaintance, who will at least consider a newcomer as worth the experiment of a call. I soon knew that Shooter Garden, the next house to our own, was occupied by a Colonel Curry, a retired Indian officer, and often, as across the low boundary wall, I caught a glimpse of a graceful girlish figure flitting about amongst the rose bushes in the neighboring garden, I would lose myself in pleasant anticipations of a time not far distant when the wall which separated us would be, metaphorically, leveled. I remember, ah, uh, how vividly, the thrill of excitement with which I heard from my mother on returning from town one evening that the Currys had called, and seemed disposed to be all that was neighborly and kind. I remember, too, the Sunday afternoon on which I returned their call, alone, as my mother had already done so during the week. I was standing on the steps of the Colonel's villa, waiting for the door to open, when I was startled by a furious snarling and yapping behind and, looking round, discovered a large poodle in the act of making for my legs. He was a coal-black poodle, with half of his right ear gone, and absurd little thick mustaches at the end of his nose. He was shaved in the sham-lion fashion, which is considered for some mysterious reason to improve a poodle, but the barber had left sundry little tufts of hair which studded his haunches capriciously. I could not help being reminded, as I looked at him, of another black poodle which Faust entertained for a short time, with unhappy results, and I thought that a very moderate degree of incantation would be enough to bring the fiend out of this brute. He made me intensely uncomfortable, for I am of a slightly nervous temperament, with a constitutional horror of dogs and a liability to attacks of diffidence on performing the ordinary social rites under the most favorable conditions, and certainly the consciousness that a strange and apparently savage dog was engaged in worrying the heels of my boots was the reverse of reassuring. The Curry family received me with all possible kindness. So charmed to make your acquaintance, Mr. Weatherhead, 
said Mrs. Currie, as I shook hands. I see, she added pleasantly, you've brought the doggy in with you. As a matter of fact, I had brought the doggy in at the ends of my coat tails, but it was evidently no unusual occurrence for visitors to appear in this undignified manner, for she detached him quite as a matter of course, and as soon as I was sufficiently collected, we fell into conversation. I discovered that the colonel and his wife were childless, and the slender, willowy figure I had seen across the garden was that of Lillian Roseblade, their niece and adopted daughter. She came into the room shortly afterwards, and I felt, as I went through the form of an introduction, that her sweet, fresh face, shaded by soft masses of dusky brown hair, more than justified all the dreamy hopes and fancies with which I had looked forward to that moment. She talked to me in a pretty, confidential, appealing way, which I never heard her dearest friends censure as childish and affected, but I thought then that her manner had an indescribable charm and fascination about it, and the memory of it makes my heart ache now with a pain that is not all pain. Even before the colonel made his appearance, I had begun to see that my enemy, the poodle, occupied an exceptional position in that household. It was abundantly clear by the time I took my leave. He seemed to be the center of their domestic system, and even lovely Lillian revolved contentedly around him as a kind of satellite. He could do no wrong in his owner's eyes. His prejudices, and he was a narrow-minded animal, were rigorously respected, and all domestic arrangements were made with a primary view to his convenience. I may be wrong, but I cannot think that it is wise to put any poodle upon such a pedestal as that. How this one, in particular, as ordinary a quadruped as ever breathed, had contrived to impose thus upon his infatuated proprietors, I never could understand. But so it was. He even engrossed the chief part of the conversation, which, after any lull, seemed to veer round to him by a sort of natural law. I had to endure a long biographical sketch of him, what a society paper would call an anecdotal photo, and each fresh anecdote seemed to me to exhibit the depraved malignity of the beast in a more glaring light and render the doting admiration of the family more astounding than ever. Did you tell Mr. Weatherhead, Lily, about Bingo? Bingo was the poodle's preposterous name. And tax? No? Oh, I must tell him that. It'll make him laugh. Tax is our gardener down in the village. Do you know Tax? Well, Tax was up here the other day, nailing up some trellis work at the top of a ladder, and all the time there was Master Bingo sitting quietly at the foot of it, looking on. Wouldn't leave it on any account. Tax said he was quite company for him. Well, at last, when Tax had finished and was coming down, what do you think that rascal there did? Just sneaked quietly up behind him and nipped him on both calves and ran off. Been looking out for that whole time. <laughs> Deep that, eh? I agreed with an inward shudder that it was very deep, thinking privately that if this was a specimen of Bingo's usual treatment of the natives, it would be odd if he did not find himself deeper still before, probably just before, he died. Poor faithful old doggy, murmured Mrs. Curry. He thought Tax was a nasty burglar, didn't he? He wasn't going to see Master robbed, was he? Capital house dog, sir, struck in the colonel. Gad, I shall never forget how he made poor Hevesides run for it the other day. Ever met Hevesides of the Bombay Fusiliers? Well, he besides was staying here, and the dog met him one morning as he was coming down from the bathroom. Didn't recognize him in pajamas and a dressing gown, of course, and made at him. He kept poor old Hevesides outside the landing window on the top of the cistern for a quarter of an hour till I had to come home and raise the siege. Such were the stories of that abandoned dog's blunder-headed ferocity to which I was forced to listen, while all the time the brute sat opposite me on the hearthrug, 
blinking at me from under his shaggy mane with his evil, bleared eyes, and deliberating where he would have me when I rose to go. This was the beginning of an intimacy which soon displaced all ceremony. It was very pleasant to go in there after dinner, even to sit with the colonel over his claret and hear more stories about bingo, for afterwards I could go into the pretty drawing-room and take my tea from Lillian's hands and listen while she played Schubert to us in the summer twilight. The poodle was always in the way, to be sure, but even his ugly black head seemed to lose some of its ugliness and ferocity when Lillian laid her pretty hand on it. On the whole, I think that the Curry family were well disposed towards me, the colonel considering me as a harmless specimen of the average eligible young man, which I certainly was, and Mrs. Curry showing me favor for my mother's sake, for whom she had taken a strong liking. As for Lillian, I believed I saw that she soon suspected the state of my feelings towards her, and was not displeased by it. I looked forward with some hopefulness to a day when I could declare myself with no fear of a repulse. But it was a serious obstacle in my path that I could not secure Bingo's good opinion on any terms. The family would often lament this pathetically themselves. You see, Mrs. Curry would observe in apology, Bingo is a dog that does not attach himself easily to strangers, though for that matter I thought he was unpleasantly ready to attach himself to me. I did try hard to conciliate him. I brought him propitiatory buns, which was weak and ineffectual, as he ate them with avidity, and hated me as bitterly as ever, for he had conceived from the first a profound contempt for me and a distrust which no blandishments of mine could remove. Looking back now, I am inclined to think it was a prophetic instinct that warned him of what was to come upon him through my instrumentality. Only his approbation was wanting to establish for me a firm footing with the Curries, and perhaps determine Lillian's wavering heart in my direction. But, though I wooed that inflexible poodle with an assiduity I blush to remember, he remained obstinately firm. Still, day by day, Lillian's treatment of me was more encouraging. Day by day, I gained in the esteem of her uncle and aunt. I began to hope that soon, I should be able to disregard canine influence altogether. Now there was one inconvenience about our villa, besides its flavor of suicide, which it is necessary to mention here. By common consent, all the cats of the neighborhood had selected our garden for their evening reunions. I fancy that a tortoise-shell kitchen cat of ours must have been a sort of leader of local feline society, I know she was at home with music and recitations on most evenings. My poor mother found this interfere with her after-dinner nap, and no wonder, for if a cohort of ghosts had been shrieking and squealing, as Calpurnia puts it, in our back garden, or it had been fitted up as a crash for a nursery of goblin infants in the agonies of teething, the noise could not possibly have been more unearthly. We sought for some means of getting rid of the nuisance. There was poison, of course, but we thought it would have an invidious appearance, and even lead to legal difficulties, if each dawn were to discover an assortment of cats expiring in hideous convulsions in various parts of the same garden. Firearms, too, were open to objection, and would scarcely assist my mother's slumbers, so for some time we were at a loss for a remedy. At last, one day, walking down the strand, I chanced to see, in an evil hour, what struck me as the very thing. It was an air gun of superior construction displayed in a gunsmith's window. I went in at once, purchased it, and took it home in triumph. It would be noiseless and would reduce the local average of cats without scandal. One or two examples and feline fashion would soon migrate to a more secluded spot. I lost no time in putting this to the proof. That same evening I lay in wait after dusk at the study window, protecting my mother's repose. As soon as I heard the long-drawn wail, the preliminary sputter, and the wild stampede that followed, 
I let fly in the direction of the sound. I suppose I must have something of the national sporting instinct in me, for my blood was tingling with excitement. But the feline constitution assimilates lead without serious inconvenience, and I began to fear that no trophy would remain to bear witness to my marksmanship. But all at once I made out a dark, indistinct form slinking in from behind the bushes. I waited till it crossed a belt of light which streamed from the back kitchen below me, and then I took careful aim and pulled the trigger. This time at least I had not failed. There was a smothered yell, a rustle, and then silence again. I ran out with the calm pride of a successful revenge to bring in the body of my victim, and I found underneath a laurel no predatory tomcat, but, as the discerning reader will no doubt have foreseen long since, the quivering carcass of the colonel's black poodle. I intend to set down here the exact unvarnished truth, and I confess that at first, when I knew what I had done, I was not sorry. I was quite innocent of any intention of doing it, but I felt no regret. I even laughed, madman that I was, at the thought that there was the end of bingo at all events. That impediment was removed. My weary task of conciliation was over forever. But soon the reaction came. I realized the tremendous nature of my deed and shuddered. I had done that which might banish me from Lillian's side forever. All unwittingly I had slaughtered a kind of sacred beast, the animal around which the Curry household had wreathed their choicest affections. How was I to break it to them? Should I send Bingo in with a card tied to his neck and my regrets and compliments? That was too much like a present of game. Ought I not to carry him in myself? I would wreathe him in the best crepe. I would put on black for him. The curries would hardly consider a taper and a white sheet, or sackcloth and ashes, an excessive form of atonement, but I could not grovel to quite such an abject extent. I wondered what the colonel would say. Simple and hearty as a general rule, he had a hot temper on occasions, and it made me ill as I thought. Would he, and, worse still, would Lillian believe it was really an accident? They knew what an interest I had in silence in the deceased poodle. Would they believe the simple truth? I vowed that they should believe me. My genuine remorse and the absence of all concealment on my part would speak powerfully for me. I would choose a favorable time for my confession. That very evening I would tell all. Still, I shrank from the duty before me, and as I knelt down sorrowfully by the dead form and respectfully composed his stiffening limbs, I thought that it was unjust of fate to place a well-meaning man, whose nerves were not of iron, in such a position. Then, to my horror, I heard a well-known ringing tramp on the road outside, and smelt the peculiar fragrance of a Burmese cheroot. It was the colonel himself who had been taking out the doomed bingo for his usual evening run. I don't know how it was exactly, but a sudden panic came over me. I held my breath and tried to crouch down unseen behind the laurels. But he had seen me and came over at once to speak to me across the hedge. He stood there, not two yards from his favorite's body. Fortunately, it was unusually dark that evening. Ha! There you are, eh? He began heartily. Don't rise, my boy, don't rise. I was trying to put myself in front of the poodle and did not rise. At least, only my hair did. You're out late, aren't you? He went on. Laying out your garden, eh? I could not tell him that I was laying out his poodle. My voice shook, as with a guilty confusion that was veiled by the dusk, I said it was a fine evening, which it was not. Cloudy, sir, said the colonel. Cloudy. Rain before morning, I think. By the way, have you seen anything of my bingo in here? This was the turning point. What I ought to have done was to say mournfully, Yes, I'm sorry to say I've had a most unfortunate accident with him. Here he is. 
The fact is, I'm afraid I've shot him. But I couldn't. I could have told him at my own time, in a prepared form of words, but not then. I felt I must use all my wits to gain time and fence with the questions. Why, I said with leaden airiness, he hasn't given you the slip, has he? Never did such a thing in his life, said the colonel warmly. He rushed off after a rat or a frog or something a few minutes ago, and as I stopped to light another cheroot, I lost sight of him. I thought I saw him slip in under your gate, but I've been calling him from the front there, and he won't come out. No, and he never would come out any more, but the colonel must not be told that just yet. I temporized again. If, I said unsteadily, if he had slipped in under the gate, I should have seen him. Perhaps he took it into his head to run home? Oh, I shall find him on the doorstep, I expect, the knowing old scamp. Why, what do you think is the last thing he did now? I could have given him the very latest intelligence, but I dared not. However, it was altogether too ghastly to kneel there and laugh at anecdotes of Bingo, told across Bingo's dead body. I could not stand that. Listen, I said suddenly, wasn't that his bark? There, again. It seems to come from the front of your house, don't you think? Well, said the colonel, I'll go and fasten him up before he's off again. How your teeth are chattering. You've caught a chill, man. Go indoors at once, and if you feel equal to it, look in half an hour later about grog time, and I'll tell you all about it. Compliments to your mother. Don't forget about grog time. I had got rid of him at last, and I wiped my forehead, gasping with relief. I would go round in half an hour, and then I should be prepared to make my melancholy announcement for even then I never thought of any other course until suddenly it flashed upon me with terrible clearness that my miserable shuffling by the hedge had made it impossible to tell the truth. I had not told a direct lie, to be sure, but then I had given the colonel the impression that I had denied having seen the dog. Many people can appease their consciences by reflecting that, whatever may be the effect their words produce, they did contrive to steer clear of a downright lie. I never quite knew where the distinction lay, morally, but there is that feeling. I have it myself. Unfortunately, prevarication has this drawback that, if ever the truth comes to light, the prevaricator is in just the same case as if he had lied to the most shameless extent, and for a man to point out that the words he used contain no absolute falsehood will seldom restore confidence. I might, of course, still tell the colonel of my misfortune, and leave him to infer that it had happened after our interview, but the poodle was fast becoming cold and stiff, and they would most probably suspect the real time of the occurrence. And then Lillian would hear that I had told a string of falsehoods to her uncle over the dead body of their idolized bingo, an act, no doubt, of abominable desecration, of unspeakable profanity in her eyes. If it would have been difficult before to prevail on her to accept a blood-stained hand, it would be impossible after that. No, I had burnt my ships. I was cut off forever from the straightforward course. That one moment of indecision had decided my conduct in spite of me. I must go on with it now and keep up the deception at all hazards. It was bitter. I had always tried to preserve as many of the moral principles which had been instilled into me as can be conveniently retained in this grasping world, and it had been my pride that, roughly speaking, I had never been guilty of an unmistakable falsehood. But henceforth, if I meant to win Lillian, that boast must be relinquished forever. I should have to lie now with all my might, without limit or scruple, to dissemble incessantly and wear a mask, as the poet Bunn beautifully expressed it long ago, over my hollow heart. I felt all this keenly. I did not think it was right, but what was I to do? After thinking all this out very carefully, 
I decided that my only course was to bury the poor animal where he fell and say nothing about it. With some vague idea of precaution, I first took off the silver collar he wore, and then hastily interred him with a garden trowel, and succeeded in removing all traces of the disaster. I fancy I felt a certain relief in the knowledge that there would now be no necessity to tell my pitiful story and risk the loss of my neighbor's esteem. By and by, I thought, I would plant a rose tree over his remains, and some day, as Lily and I, in the noontide of our domestic bliss, stood before it admiring its creamy luxuriance, I might, perhaps, find courage to confess that the tree owed some of that luxuriance to the long-lost bingo. There was a touch of poetry in this idea that lightened my gloom for the moment. I need scarcely say that I did not go around a shooter garden that evening. I was not hardened enough for that yet. My manner might betray me, and so I very prudently stayed at home. But that night my sleep was broken by frightful dreams. I was perpetually trying to bury a great gaunt poodle, which would persist in rising up through the damp mold as fast as I covered him up. Lillian and I were engaged, and we were in church together on Sunday, and the poodle, resisting all attempts to eject him, forbade our bands with sepulchral barks. It was our wedding day, and at the critical moment the poodle leaped between us and swallowed the ring, or we were at the wedding breakfast, and Bingo, a grisly black skeleton with flaming eyes, sat on the cake and would not allow Lillian to cut it. Even the rose tree fancy was reproduced in a distorted form. The tree grew, and every blossom contained a miniature bingo which barked, and as I woke I was desperately trying to persuade the colonel that they were ordinary dog roses. I went up to the office next day with my gloomy secret gnawing my bosom, and, whatever I did, the specter of the murdered poodle rose before me. For two days after that I dared not go near the curries, until at last, one evening after dinner, I forced myself to call, feeling that it was really not safe to keep away any longer. My conscience smote me as I went in. I put on an unconscious, easy manner, which was such a dismal failure that it was lucky for me that they were too much engrossed to notice it. I never before saw a family so stricken down by a domestic misfortune as the group I found in the drawing-room, making a dejected pretense of reading or working. We talked at first, and hollow talk it was, on indifferent subjects, till I could bear it no longer, and plunged boldly into danger. "'I don't see the dog,' I began. "'I suppose you, you found him all right the other evening, Colonel?' I wondered, as I spoke, whether they would not notice the break in my voice, but they did not. "'Why, the fact is,' said the colonel heavily, gnawing his gray mustache, "'we've not heard anything of him since. He's, he's run off.' "'Gone, Mr. Weatherhead, gone without a word,' said Mrs. Curry, plaintively, as if she thought the dog might at least have left an address. "'I wouldn't have believed it of him,' said the colonel. It has completely knocked me over. Haven't been so cut up for years, the ungrateful rascal. Oh, uncle, pleaded Lillian, don't talk like that. Perhaps Bingo couldn't help it. Perhaps someone has sh shot him. Shot, cried the colonel angrily. By heaven, if I thought there was a villain on earth capable of shooting that poor inoffensive dog, I'd... Why should they shoot him, Lillian? tell me that. I, I hope you won't let me hear you talk like that again. You don't think he's shot, eh, Weatherhead? I said, heaven forgive me that I thought it highly improbable. He's not dead, cried Mrs. Curry. If he were dead, I should know it somehow. I'm sure I should. But I'm certain he's alive. Only last night I had such a beautiful dream about him. I thought he came back to us, Mr. Weatherhead, driving up in a handsome cab, and he was just the same as ever, 
only he wore blue spectacles, and the shaved part of him was painted a bright red, and I woke up with the joy. So you know, it's sure to come true. It will be easily understood what torture conversations like these were to me, and how I hated myself as I sympathized and spoke encouraging words concerning the dog's recovery, when I knew all the time he was lying hid under my garden mold. But I took it as a part of my punishment, and bore it all uncomplainingly. Practice even made me an adept in the art of consolation. I believe I really was a great comfort to them. I had hoped that they would soon get over the first bitterness of their loss, and that Bingo would be first replaced and then forgotten in the usual way. But there seemed no signs of this coming to pass. The poor colonel was too plainly fretting himself ill about it. He went pottering about forlornly, advertising, searching, and seeing people, but all, of course, to no purpose, and it told upon him. He was more like a man whose only son and heir had been stolen than an Anglo-Indian officer who had lost a poodle. I had to affect the liveliest interest in all his inquiries and expeditions, and to listen to and echo the most extravagant eulogies of the departed, and the wear and tear of so much duplicity made me at last almost as ill as the colonel himself. I could not help seeing that Lillian was not nearly so much impressed by my elaborate concern as her relatives, and sometimes I detected an incredulous look in her frank brown eyes that made me very uneasy. Little by little a rift widened between us, until at last, in despair, I determined to know the worst before the time came when it would be hopeless to speak at all. I chose a Sunday evening, as we were walking across the green from church in the golden dusk, and then I ventured to speak of her, of my love. She heard me to the end, and was evidently very much agitated. At last she murmured that it could not be, unless... No. It never could be now. Unless what? I asked. Lillian, Miss Roseblade, something has come between us lately. You will tell me what that something is, won't you? Do you want to know, really? she said, looking up at me through her tears. Then I'll tell you. It, it's bingo. I started back overwhelmed. Did she know all? If not, how much did she suspect? I must find out that at once. What about bingo? I managed to pronounce with a dry tongue. You never loved him when he was here, she sobbed. You know you didn't. I was relieved to find it was no worse than this. No, I said candidly. I did not love Bingo. Bingo didn't love me, Lillian. He was always looking out for a chance of nipping me somewhere. Surely you won't quarrel with me for that. Not for that, she said. Only... Why do you pretend to be so fond of him now, and so anxious to get him back again? Uncle John believes you, but I don't. I can see quite well that you wouldn't be glad to find him. You could find him easily if you wanted to. What do you mean, Lillian? I said hoarsely. How could I find him? Again, I feared the worst. You're in a government office, cried Lillian and if you only chose, you could easily get government to find Bingo. What's the use of government if I can't do that? Mr. Travers would have found him long ago if I'd asked him. Lillian had never been so childishly unreasonable as this before, and yet I loved her more madly than ever. But I did not like this allusion to Travers, a rising barrister, who lived with his sister in a pretty cottage near the station, and had shown symptoms of being attracted by Lillian. He was away on circuit just then, luckily, but at last even he would have found it a hard task to find Bingo. There was comfort in that. "'You know that isn't just, Lillian,' I observed. "'But only tell me, what do you want me to do?' But. But bring back Bingo, she said. Bring back Bingo, I cried in horror. But suppose I can't. 
Suppose he's out of the country, or dead. What then, Lillian? I can't help it, she said, but I don't believe he is out of the country or dead. And while I see you pretending to Uncle that you cared awfully about him, and going on doing nothing at all, it makes me think you're not quite, quite sincere, and I couldn't possibly marry anyone while I thought that of him, and I shall always have that feeling unless you find Bingo. It was of no use to argue with her. I knew Lillian by that time. With her pretty, caressing manner, she united a latent obstinacy which it was hopeless to attempt to shake. I feared, too, that she was not quite certain as yet whether she cared for me or not, and that this condition of hers was an expedient to gain time. I left her with a heavy heart. Unless I proved my worth by bringing back Bingo within a very short time, Travers would probably have everything his own way and Bingo was dead. However, I took heart. I thought that perhaps if I could succeed in my earnest efforts in persuading Lillian that I really was doing all in my power to recover the poodle, she might relent in time and dispense with his actual production. So, partly with this object, and partly to appease the remorse which now revived and stung me deeper than before, I undertook long and weary pilgrimages after office hours. I spent many pounds in advertisements. I interviewed dogs of every size, color, and breed, and, of course, I took care to keep Lillian informed of each successive failure. But still, her heart was not touched. She was firm. If I went on like that, she told me, I was certain to find Bingo one day. Then, but not before, would her doubts be set at rest. I was walking one day through the somewhat squalid district which lies between Bow Street and High Holborn, when I saw in a small theatrical costumier's window a handbill stating that a black poodle had followed a gentleman on a certain date, and if not claimed and the finder remunerated before a stated time, would be sold to pay expenses. I went in and got a copy of the bill to show Lillian and although by that time I scarcely dared to look a poodle in the face, I thought I would go to the address given and see the animal, simply to be able to tell Lillian I had done so. The gentleman, whom the dog had very unaccountably followed, was a certain Mr. William Blagg, who kept a little shop near Endell Street, and called himself a bird fancier, though I should scarcely have credited him with the necessary imagination. He was an evil-browed ruffian in a fur cap, with a broad, broken nose and little shifty red eyes, and after I told him what I wanted, he took me through a horrible little den stacked with piles of wooden wire and wicker prisons, each quivering with restless, twittering life, and then out into a backyard in which were two or three rotten old kennels and tubs. That there's him he said, jerking his thumb to the farthest tub. Followed me all the way home from Kensington Gardens, he did. Come out, will you? And out of the tub there crawled slowly, with a snuffling whimper and a rattling of its chain, the identical dog I had slain a few evenings before. At least so I thought for a moment, and felt as if I had seen a specter. The resemblance was so exact in size, in every detail, even to the little clumps of hair about the hind parts, even to the lop of half an ear, this dog might have been the doppelganger of the deceased Bingo. I suppose, after all, one black poodle is very like any other black poodle of the same size, but the likeness startled me. I think it was then that the idea occurred to me that here was a miraculous chance of securing the sweetest girl in the whole world and at the same time atoning for my wrong by bringing back gladness with me to shoot her garden. It only needed a little boldness, one last deception, and I could embrace truthfulness once more. Almost unconsciously, when my guide turned round and asked, Is that your dog, Yern? I said hurriedly, Yes, yes, that's the dog I want, that, that's bingo. He don't seem to be a putting off hisself out about seeing you again, observed Mr. Blagg, as the poodle studied me with calm interest. 
Oh, he's not exactly my dog, you see, I said. He belongs to a friend of mine. He gave me a quick, furtive glance. Then maybe you're mistook about him, he said, and I can't run no risks. I was a-going down in the country this year very evening to see a party as lives in Wisteria Willa. He's been a-advertising about a black poodle, he has. But look here, I said, that's me. He gave me a curious leer. No offense, you know, Governor, he said, but I should wish for some evidence as to that afore I part with a valuable dog like this here. Well, I said, here's one of my cards. Will that do for you? He took it and spelt it out with a pretense of great caution, but I saw well enough that the old scoundrel suspected that if I had lost a dog at all, it was not this particular dog. Ah, he said as he put it in his pocket, if I part with him to you, I must be cleared of all risks. I can't afford to get into trouble about no mistakes. Unless you likes to leave him for a day or two, you must pay a cordon, you see. I wanted to get the hateful business over as soon as possible. I did not care what I paid. Lillian was worth all the expense. I said I had no doubt myself as to the real ownership of the animal, but I would give him any sum in reason and would remove the dog at once. And so we settled it. I paid him an extortionate sum and came away with a duplicate poodle, a canine counterfeit which I hoped to pass off at Shooter Garden as the long-lost bingo. I know it was wrong. It even came unpleasantly near dog-stealing but I was a desperate man. I saw Lillian gradually slipping away from me. I knew that nothing short of this could ever recall her. I was sorely tempted. I had gone far on the same road already. It was the old story of being hung for a sheep, and so I fell. Surely some who read this will be generous enough to consider the peculiar state of the case and mingle a little pity with their contempt. I was dining in town that evening and took my purchase home by a late train. His demeanor was grave and intensely respectable. He was not the animal to commit himself by any flagrant indiscretion. He was gentle and tractable too, and in all respects an agreeable contrast in character to the original. Still, it may have been the after-dinner workings of conscience but I could not help fancying that I saw a certain look in the creature's eyes, as if he were unaware that he was required to connive at a fraud, and rather resented it. If he would only be good enough to back me up. Fortunately, however, he was such a perfect facsimile of the outward bingo that the risk of detection was really inconsiderable. When I got him home, I put Bingo's silver collar around his neck, congratulating myself on my forethought in preserving it, and took him in to see my mother. She accepted him as what he seemed, without the slightest misgiving. But this, though it encouraged me to go on, was not decisive. The spurious poodle would have to encounter the scrutiny of those who knew every tuft of the genuine animal's body. Nothing would have induced me to undergo such an ordeal as that of personally restoring him to the curries. We gave him supper and tied him up on the lawn, where he howled dolefully all night and buried bones. The next morning I wrote a note to Mrs. Curry, expressing my pleasure at being able to restore the lost one, and another to Lillian, containing only the words, Will you believe now that I am sincere? Then I tied both round the poodle's neck and dropped him over the wall into the colonel's garden just before I started to catch my train to town. I had an anxious walk home from the station that evening. I went round by the longer way, trembling the whole time lest I should meet any of the Curry household, to which I felt myself entirely unequal just then. I could not rest until I knew whether my fraud had succeeded, or if the poodle to which I had entrusted my fate had basely betrayed me. But my suspense was happily ended as soon as I entered my mother's room. "'You can't think how delighted those poor curries were to see Bingo again,' she said at once. 
and they said such charming things about you, Algy. Lillian, particularly, quite affected she seemed. Poor child. And they wanted you to go round and dine there and be thanked tonight. But at last I persuaded them to come to us instead. And they're going to bring the dog to make friends. Oh, and I met Frank Travers. He's back from circuit again now, so I asked him in, too, to meet them. I drew a deep breath of relief. I had played a desperate game, but I had won. I could have wished, to be sure, that my mother had not thought of bringing in Travers on that of all evenings, but I hoped that I could defy him after this. The colonel and his people were the first to arrive, he and his wife being so effusively grateful that they made me very uncomfortable indeed. Lillian met me with downcast eyes and the faintest possible blush, but she said nothing just then. Five minutes afterwards, when she and I were alone together in the conservatory, where I had brought her on pretense of showing a new begonia, she laid her hand on my sleeve and whispered, almost shyly, Mr. Weatherhead, Algernon, can you ever forgive me for being so cruel and unjust to you? And I replied that, upon the whole, I could. We were not in that conservatory long, but before we left it, beautiful Lillian Roseblade had consented to make my life happy. When we re-entered the drawing-room, we found Frank Travers, who had been told the story of the recovery, and I observed his jaw fall as he glanced at our faces and noted the triumphant smile, which I have no doubt mine wore, and the tender dreamy look in Lillian's soft eyes. Poor Travers! I was sorry for him, although I was not fond of him. Travers was a good type of the rising young common-law barrister, tall, not bad-looking, with keen dark eyes, black whiskers, and the mobile forensic mouth which can express every shade of feeling, from deferential assent to cynical incredulity, possessed, too, of an endless flow of conversation that was decidedly agreeable, if a trifle too laboriously so, he had been a dangerous rival. But all that was over now. He saw it himself at once, and during dinner sank into dismal silence, gazing pathetically at Lillian, and sighing almost obtrusively between the courses. His stream of small talk seemed to have been cut off at the main. "'You've done a kind thing, Weatherhead,' said the colonel. I can't tell you all that dog is to me, and how I miss the poor beast. I'd quite given up all hope of ever seeing him again, and all the time there was Weatherhead, Mr. Travers, quietly searching all London till he found him. I shan't forget it. It shows a really kind feeling. I saw by Travers' face that he was telling himself he would have found fifty bingos in half the time, if he had only thought of it. He smiled a melancholy assent to all the colonel said, and then began to study me with an obviously depreciatory air. "'You can't think,' I heard Mrs. Curry telling my mother, "'how really touching it was to see poor dear Bingo's emotion at seeing all the old familiar objects again. He went up and sniffed at them all in turn, quite plainly recognizing everything.' and he was quite put out to find that we had moved his favorite ottoman out of the drawing-room. But he is so penitent, too, and so ashamed of having run away, he hardly dares to come when John calls him, and he kept under a chair in the hall all the morning. He wouldn't come in here either, so we had to leave him in your garden. "'He's been sadly out of spirits all day,' said Lillian. "'He hasn't bitten one of the tradespeople.' "'Oh, he's all right, the rascal,' said the colonel cheerily. "'He'll be after the cats again as well as ever in a day or two. "'Ah, those cats,' said my poor innocent mother. "'Algy, you haven't tried the air-gun on them again lately, have you? "'They're worse than ever.' "'I troubled the colonel to pass the claret. "'Travers laughed for the first time. "'That's a good idea.' he said in that carrying bar-mess voice of his, an air-gun for cats. <laughs> Make good bags, eh, Weatherhead? I said that I did, very good bags, and felt I was getting painfully red in the face. 
"'Oh, Algy is an excellent shot, quite a sportsman,' said my mother. "'I remember, oh, long ago, when we lived at Hammersmith. He had a pistol, and he used to strew crumbs in the garden for the sparrows and shoot at them out of the pantry window. He frequently hit one.' "'Well,' said the colonel, not much impressed by these sporting reminiscences, "'don't go rolling over our bingo by mistake, you know, Weatherhead, my boy.' Not but what you've a sort of right after this. Only don't. I wouldn't go through it twice for anything. If you really won't take any more wine, I said hurriedly, addressing the colonel and Travers, suppose we all go out and have our coffee on the lawn? It, it'll be cooler there. For it was getting very hot indoors, I thought. I left Travers to amuse the ladies. He could do no more harm now. And taking the colonel aside, I seized the opportunity, as we strolled up and down the garden path, to ask his consent to Lillian's engagement to me. He gave it cordially. "'There's not a man in England,' he said, "'that I'd sooner see her married to after today. "'You're a quiet, steady young fellow, and you've a good, kind heart. "'As for the money, that's neither here nor there. "'Lillian won't come to you without a penny, you know.' But really, my boy, you can hardly believe what it is to my poor wife and me to see that dog. Why, bless my soul, look at him now. What's the matter with him, eh? To my unutterable horror, I saw that this miserable poodle, after begging unnoticed at the tea table for some time, had retired to an open space before it, where he was now industriously standing on his head. We gathered round and examined the animal curiously, as he continued to balance himself gravely in this abnormal position. "'Good gracious, John,' cried Mrs. Curry. "'I never saw Bingo do such a thing before in his life.' "'Very odd,' said the colonel, putting up his glasses. "'Never learnt that from me.' "'I tell you what I fancy it is,' I suggested wildly. You see, he was always a sensitive, excitable animal, and perhaps the, the, the sudden joy of his return has gone to his head, upset him, you know. They seemed disposed to accept this solution, and indeed I believe they would have credited Bingo with every conceivable degree of sensibility. But I felt myself that if this unhappy animal had many more of these accomplishments, I was undone, for the original Bingo had never been a dog of parts. "'It's very odd,' said Travers, reflectively, as the dog recovered his proper level. "'But I always thought that it was half the right ear that Bingo had lost.' "'So it is, isn't it?' said the colonel. "'Left, eh? Well, I thought myself it was the right.' My heart almost stopped with terror. I had altogether forgotten that. I hastened to set the point at rest. "'Oh, it was the left.' I said positively. I know it because I remember so particularly thinking how odd it was that it should be the left ear and not the right. I told myself this should be positively my last lie. Why odd? asked Travers, with his most offensive Socratic manner. My dear fellow, I can't tell you, I said impatiently. Everything seems odd when you come to think at all about it. Algernon, said Lillian later on, will you tell Aunt Mary and Mr. Travers and, and me how it was you came to find Bingo? Mr. Travers is quite anxious to hear all about it. I could not very well refuse. I sat down and told the story all my own way. I painted Blag, perhaps rather bigger and blacker than life, and described an exciting scene in which I recognized Bingo by his collar in the streets, and claimed and bore him off then and there in spite of all opposition. I had the inexpressible pleasure of seeing Travers grinding his teeth with envy as I went on, and feeling Lillian's soft, slender hand slide gently into mine as I told my tale in the twilight. All at once, just as I reached the climax, we heard the poodle barking furiously at the hedge which separated my garden from the road. "'There's a foreign-looking man staring over the hedge,' said Lillian. "'Bingo always did hate foreigners.' There certainly was a swarthy man there, and, though I had no reason for it then, 
Somehow my heart died within me at the sight of him. "'Don't be alarmed, sir,' cried the colonel. "'The dog won't bite you, unless there's a hole in the hedge anywhere.' The stranger took off his small straw hat with a sweep. "'Ah, I am not afraid,' he said, and his accent proclaimed him a Frenchman. "'He is not enraged at me. May I ask, is it permit to speak with Mr. Vezeret? I felt I must deal with this person alone, for I feared the worst, and, asking them to excuse me, I went to the hedge and faced the Frenchman with a frightful calm of despair. He was a short, stout little man, with blue cheeks, sparkling black eyes, and a vivacious walnut-colored countenance. He wore a short, black alpaca coat, and a large white cravat with an immense oval malachite brooch in the center of it, which I mentioned because I found myself staring mechanically at it during the interview. "'My name is Weatherhead,' I began with the bearing of a detected pickpocket. "'Can I be of any service to you?' "'Of a great service,' he said emphatically. "'You can restore to me the poodle which I see here.' Nemesis had called at last in the shape of a rival claimant. I staggered for an instant. Then I said, Oh, I think you are under a mistake. That dog is not mine. I know it, he said. There has been little mistake. So if the dog is not to you, you can give him back to me, ain? I tell you, I said, that poodle belongs to the gentleman over there and I pointed to the colonel, seeing that it was best now to bring him into the affair without delay. "'You are wrong,' he said doggedly. "'The poodle is my poodle, and I was direct to you. It is your name on the cart.' And he presented me with that fatal card which I had been foolish enough to give to Blagg as a proof of my identity. I saw it all now. The old villain had betrayed me, and to earn a double reward had put the real owner on my track. I decided to call the colonel at once, and attempt to brazen it out with the help of his sincere belief in the dog. "'Hey, what's that? What's it all about?' said the colonel, bustling up, followed at intervals by the others. The Frenchman raised his hat again. "'I do not want to make trouble,' he began, "'but there is little mistake. My word of honor, sir, I see my own poodle in your garden.' When I appealed to this gentleman to restore him, he referred me to you. You must allow me to know my own dog, sir, said the colonel. Why, I've had him from a pup. Bingo, old boy, you know your master, don't you? But the brute ignored him altogether and began to leap wildly at the hedge in frantic efforts to join the Frenchman. It needed no Solomon to decide his ownership. I tell you, you have got the wrong poodle. It is my own dog, my Azor. He remembered me well, you see. I lose him, it is three, four days. I see a notice that he is found, and yen I go to the address, they tell me, oh, he is reclaimed. He has gone with a stranger who has advertised. They show me the placard. I follow here, and yen I arrive, I see my poodle in the garden before me. "'But look here,' said the colonel impatiently. "'It's all very well to say that, but how can you prove it? "'I give you my word that the dog belongs to me. "'You must prove your claim, eh, Travers?' "'Yes,' said Travers judicially. "'Mere assertion is no proof. "'It's oath against oath at present.' "'Attends an instant. "'Your poodle, was he highly trained? "'Had he some talents? "'A dog with tricks, eh?' "'No, he's not,' said the colonel. "'I don't like to see dogs taught to play the fool. "'There's none of that nonsense about him, sir.' "'Ah, remark him well, then. "'Azor, mon chou, danse donc un peu.' "'And on the foreigner's whistling a lively air, "'that infernal poodle rose on his hind legs "'and danced solemnly about, halfway round the garden. "'We inside followed his movements with dismay.' "'Why, dash it all!' cried the disgusted colonel. "'He's dancing along like a damn mountbank. "'But it's my bingo for all that.' "'You are not convinced? "'You shall see more. "'Azor, ici. "'Por Bismarck, Azor. 
The poodle barked ferociously. Porgabeta! He wagged his tail and began to leap with joy. Mur pour la patrie! And the two accomplished animal rolled over as if killed in battle. Where would Bingo have picked up so much French? cried Lillian incredulously. Or so much French history, added that serpent Travers. Shall I command them to jump or reverse himself? inquired the obliging Frenchman. We've seen that, thank you, said the colonel gloomily. Upon my word, I don't know what to think. It can't be that that's not my bingo after all. I'll never believe it. I tried a last desperate stroke. Will you come round to the front? I said to the Frenchman. I'll let you in, and we can discuss the matter quietly. Then, as we walked back together, I asked him eagerly what he would take to abandon his claims and let the colonel think the poodle was his after all. He was furious. He considered himself insulted. With great emotion, he informed me that the dog was the pride of his life. It seems to be the mission of black poodles to serve as domestic comforts of this priceless kind. And that he would not part with him for twice his weight in gold. Figured, he began, as we joined the others, that this gentleman here has offered me money for the dog. He agrees that it is to me, you see. Very well, then, there is no more to be said. Why, Weatherhead, have you lost faith too, then? said the colonel. I saw that it was no good. All I wanted now was to get out of it creditably and get rid of the Frenchman. I am sorry to say, I replied, that I am afraid I have been deceived by the extraordinary likeness. I don't think, on reflection, that that is Bingo. What do you think, Travers? asked the colonel. Well, since you ask me, said Travers, with quite unnecessary dryness, I never did think so. Nor I, said the colonel. I thought from the first that that was never my bingo. Why, bingo would make two of that beast. And Lillian and her aunt both protested that they had had their doubts from the first. Then you permit that I remove him, said the Frenchman. Certainly, said the colonel. And after some apologies on our part for the mistake, he went off in triumph with the detestable poodle frisking after him. When he had gone, the colonel laid his hand kindly on my shoulder. Don't look so cut up about it, my boy, he said. You did your best. There was a sort of likeness to anyone who didn't know Bingo as we did. Just then the Frenchman again appeared at the hedge. A thousand pardons, he said, but I find this upon my dog. It is not to me. Suffer me to restore of his many compliments. It was Bingo's collar. Travers took it from his hand and brought it to us. This was on the dog when you stopped that fellow, didn't you say? He asked me. One more lie, and I was so weary of falsehood. Y yes, I said reluctantly, that was so. Very extraordinary, said Travers. That's the wrong poodle beyond a doubt, but when he's found, he's wearing the right dog's collar. Now, how do you account for that? My good fellow, I said impatiently, I'm not in the witness box. I can't account for it. It's, it's a mere coincidence. But look here, my dear Weatherhead, argued Travers. Whether in good faith or not, I never could quite make out. Don't you see what a tremendously important link it is? Here's a dog who, as I understand the facts, had a silver collar with his name engraved on it round his neck at the time he was lost. Here's that identical collar turning up soon afterwards round the neck of a totally different dog. We must follow this up. We must get at the bottom of it somehow. With a clue like this, we're sure to find out either the dog himself or what's become of him. Just try to recollect exactly what happened. There's a good fellow. This is just the sort of thing I like. It was the sort of thing I did not enjoy at all. 
"'You must excuse me tonight, Travers,' I said uncomfortably. "'You see, just now it's rather a sore subject for me, and I'm not feeling very well.' I was grateful just then for a reassuring glance of pity and confidence from Lillian's sweet eyes, which revived my drooping spirits for the moment. "'Yes, we'll go into it tomorrow, Travers,' said the Colonel. "'And then, hello, why, there's that confounded Frenchman again!' It was indeed. He came prancing back delicately, with a malicious enjoyment on his wrinkled face. "'Once more I return to apologize,' he said. "'My poodle has permitted himself the grave indiscretion to make a very big hole at the bottom of the garden.' I assured him that it was of no consequence. "'Perhaps,' he replied, looking steadily at me through his keen, half-shut eyes, you will not say that when you regard the whole. And you others, I speak to you. Sometimes one loses a something which is quite near all the time. It is very droll, no? My word! <laughs> and he ambled off with an aggressively fiendish laugh that chilled my blood. What the deuce did he mean by that, eh? said the colonel blankly. Don't know, said Travers. Suppose we go and inspect the hole. But before that I had contrived to draw near it myself, in deadly fear lest the Frenchman's last words had contained some innuendo which I had not understood. It was light enough still for me to see something, at the unexpected horror of which I very nearly fainted. That thrice accursed poodle which I had been insane enough to attempt to foist upon the colonel must, it seems, have buried his supper the night before very near the spot in which I had laid Bingo, and in his attempts to exhume his bone had brought the remains of my victim to the surface. There the corpse lay, on the very top of the excavations. Time had not, of course, improved its appearance, which was ghastly in the extreme, but still plainly recognizable by the eye of affection. "'It's a very ordinary hole,' I gasped, putting myself before it and trying to turn them back. "'Nothing in it, nothing at all.' "'Except one Algernon Weatherhead Esquire, eh?' whispered Travers jocosely in my ear. "'No, but,' persisted the Colonel, advancing, "'look here. Has the dog damaged any of your shrubs?' No, no, I cried piteously. Quite the reverse. Let's all go indoors now. It's getting so cold. See, there's a shrub or something uprooted, said the colonel, still coming nearer that fatal hole. Why, hello, look there. What's that? Lillian, who was by his side, gave a slight scream. Uncle, she cried, it looks like, like bingo. The colonel turned suddenly upon me. "'Do you hear?' he demanded in a choked voice. "'You hear what she says? Can't you speak out? Is that our bingo?' I gave it up at last. I only longed to be allowed to crawl away under something. "'Yes,' I said in a dull whisper as I sat down heavily on the garden seat. "'Yes, that's bingo. Misfortune. Shoot him. Quite an accident.' There was a terrible explosion after that. They saw at last how I had deceived them, and put the very worst construction upon everything. Even now I writhe impotently at times, and my cheeks smart and tingle with humiliation as I recall that scene. The colonel's very plain speaking, Lillian's passionate reproaches and contempt, and her aunt's speechless prostration of disappointment. I made no attempt to defend myself. I was not perhaps the complete villain they deemed me, but I felt dully that no doubt it all served me perfectly right. Still, I do not think I am under any obligation to put their remarks down in black and white here. Travers had vanished at the first opportunity, whether out of delicacy or the fear of breaking out into unseasonable mirth, I cannot say and shortly afterwards the others came to where I sat silent with bowed head, and bade me a stern and final farewell. 
And then, as the last gleam of Lillian's white dress vanished down the garden path, I laid my head down on the table amongst the coffee cups and cried like a beaten child. I got leave as soon as I could and went abroad. The morning after my return, I noticed, while shaving, that there was a small square marble tablet placed against the wall of the colonel's garden. I got my opera glass and read, and pleasant reading it was, the following inscription. In affectionate memory of Bingo, secretly and cruelly put to death in cold blood by a neighbor and friend, June 1881. If this explanation of mine ever reaches my neighbor's eyes, I humbly hope that they will have the humanity either to take away or tone down that tablet. They cannot conceive what I suffer when curious visitors insist, as they do every day, in spelling out the words from our windows and asking me countless questions about them. Sometimes I meet the curries about the village, and as they pass me with averted heads, I feel myself growing crimson. Travers is almost always with Lillian now. He has given her a dog, a fox terrier, and they take ostentatiously elaborate precautions to keep it out of my garden. I should like to assure them here that they need not be under any alarm. I have shot one dog. End of the Black Poodle Recording by Roger Moline A Question of Time by Sergeant Kame This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher a Question of Time by Sergeant Kame The native pilot who is to take the gunboat Utica around from Ilo Ilo to Capiz is a traitor. I have just discovered indisputable proof of that fact. He has agreed to run the gunboat aground on a ledge near one of the Gigantes Islands, on which a force of insurgents is to be hidden, large enough to overpower the men on the gunboat in her disabled condition. Do not let her leave Ilo Ilo until you have a new pilot, and one you are sure of. Demoni Captain James Damani, of the American Army in the Philippine Islands, folded the dispatch which he had just written and sealed it. Then, calling an orderly to him, he said, Send Sergeant Johnson to me. Captain Damani's company was then at Pasai, a small inland town in the island of Panay. He had been dispatched by the American general commanding at Ilo Ilo, the chief seaport of Panay, to march to Capiz, a seaport town on the opposite side of the island to assist from the land side a small force of Americans besieged there by the natives, while the gunboat Utica was to steam around the northeastern promontory of the island and cooperate from the water side of the town in its relief. The distance across the island was about fifty miles, while that by water, by the route which the Utica must traverse, was about two hundred miles. Captain Demoni, starting first, had covered half the march laid out for him, without incident until, halting at Pasai, halfway across the island and well up in the mountains, he had been so fortunate as to obtain the information which he was about to send back to the commander at Ilo Ilo. Panay had been, up to this time, one of the most quiet islands in the group. He had met with no opposition in his march so far, and it was believed that the only natives on the island who were under arms were those living in the northeastern part of the territory. It was a force of these that had invested Capiz. Sergeant Johnson, sir, the orderly reported. Very well, send him in. A young man, wearing a faded brown duck uniform, tightly buttoned leggings, and a wide-rimmed gray hat, entered the tent. I have sent for you, Sergeant, said Captain Demani, for two reasons. One is that I want a man who is brave, and one whom I can trust. The sergeant bent his head slightly, in acknowledgment of the implied compliment, his cheeks looking a trifle darker shade of brown, where the blood had flushed the skin beneath its double-deep coat of tan. The other reason, the officer went on, is that I want a man of whose muscle and endurance as a runner and whose skill as a boatman, I have had some proof. In spite of the difference in rank, and the seriousness of the situation which the officer knew and the man guessed, the two men looked at each other and smiled, for one was a Harvard man, and the other had come from Yale. The gunboat Utica is to leave Ilo Ilo at midnight tonight. It is of the very greatest importance that this dispatch, 
handing him the letter. Be delivered to the American general at Ilo Ilo before the vessel gets under way. I entrust it to you to see that it is delivered. You ought to have no trouble in getting there in ample season, the captain continued, spreading out a map so that the other man could see it. I cannot spare any men for an escort for you, because my force is already far too small for what we have to do. Instead of following back the road we took in coming here, which would be impassable for any one but a man on foot, even if I had a horse for you, which I have not, I think you can make better time by another route. Six miles from here, pointing to the map, you will reach the same river which we crossed at a point farther up the stream. Get a boat there and go down the river some fifteen or twenty miles, until you come to a native village built at the head of steep falls in the stream. I am told that until you reach there the river is navigable, and that the current is so swift much of the way that you can make rapid progress. At that village you will have to leave your boat, but from that place you will find the clearly marked path to Ilo Ilo. The quicker you start the better, and, as I have told you, I trust it to you to see that the general has the dispatch before the Utica leaves port. It was ten o'clock in the forenoon when the sergeant had been sent for to come to headquarters. Half an hour later he had started, the letter tightly wrapped in a bit of rubber blanket before he had placed it inside his jacket, for he had already had enough experience with the native boats to know how unstable they would be in the current of a rapid river. The five miles from Passai to the river were easily made, in spite of the fact that it was midday, for there was a good path which, for nearly all the distance, was shaded by lofty trees. When he reached the river, the sergeant bought from a man whom he found there a native banca for three dollars, a sum of money which would have made a native rich. In this boat he started on his voyage down the river. A native banca is a dugout, a canoe hollowed out from the trunk of a tree. It is propelled and guided by a short, broad-bladed paddle, and is as unstable as the lightest racing shell, although not anywhere nearly so easy to send through the water. It was unfortunate for the sergeant that he did not know, what he could not, since the map did not show it, that the place where the path touched the river first was on the upper side of a huge oxbow bend. If he had kept on by land, a third of a mile's walk farther through the swamp would have brought him to the river again, at a point to reach which by water, following the river's windings, he would have to paddle three or four miles. Another thing which was unfortunate, that he could not know the nature of the man from whom he bought the banca, any better than he could know the nature of the river, and so did not suspect that he was dealing with a tulisani, to whom the little bag of money which the officer had shown when he had paid for the boat had looked like boundless wealth, to see which was to plan to possess. A Tulisani is to the Philippine Islands what a brigand is to Italy, a bandit to Spain, a highwayman to England, and a train robber to America. A man who lives by his wits, and stops at no means to gain his object. The banca, by the way, was stolen property. This man would have stabbed the American soldier when he stooped to step cautiously into the slippery boat, and taken the purse from his dead body, had he not been far-sighted enough to see that the purse might be had, and much more money beside. The Tulisani knew that the American soldiers were at Pasai. Although he did not find it best to come to town himself in general, he never had any trouble finding men to go there for him, and bring him news or carry messages. No bandit leader who promptly carves an ear off the man who does his errands grudgingly is half so feared as a Filipino Tulisani, whom his fellows know to be the possessor of a powerful anting-anting, and this man's anting-anting was famous for the wonders which it had done. The Tulisane knew that the American soldiers were at Pasai, and that the man who led them lived in one of the white tents they had set up there. This man in the brown clothes, which looked so tight that it made the Filipino tired just to look at them, could be no common soldier, else he would not be paying three big silver dollars for a banca. If anything was to happen to this man, that is, if he was to disappear, and still not be dead, and the officer in the white tent should know of it, the leader of the white soldiers would no doubt pay much money to have this man brought safely back. Consequently, the man in the brown clothes with the fat money purse should be made to disappear. That was the way the Tulisani reasoned. It was the three dollars, the rest of the money in the purse, and the ransom which the leader of the white men would pay, which influenced the Filipino. It was not that the Asiatic highwayman cared a leaf of a forest tree for patriotism. So long as he got the money, white men and brown men were all alike to him, American soldiers, and Filipino insurgents. So the native, going into the forest, a little way back from the river, looked until he found a tree, the roots of which growing out from well up the trunk had made a sort of great wooden drum. Taking a stout stick of hardwood, which had been leaned against a tree, he had been there before, he struck the hollow tree three heavy blows, the sound of which went echoing off through the forest. Then the man listened. Not long, for from far, very far away, there came an answer 
one blow, and then, after a moment's pause, two more. The drum beach which followed, and the pauses for the faint replies, were like listening to a giant's telegraph. The soldier, paddling steadily out around the river's winding course, heard the noise and wondered curiously what it was. The natives who heard it said, The trees are talking, meaning that someone was making them talk. To the Tulisane, the sounds meant that he was bringing his partner to help him, just as at night the far-off, long-drawn cry of a panther calls the creature's mate to share the prey. Sergeant Johnson, still paddling, after he would have said that with the help of the current he had put four good miles of the river behind him, saw a tiny ripple in the water ahead of the boat, but in a stream so rapid thought nothing of it. An instant later a coconut fiber rope, stretched taut across the river and just below the surface of the water, had turned his skittish boat bottom upward. The Tulisane, you see, had seen the sergeant's revolver, and thought wisest to attack him wet. Drenched, blowing for breath, before he knew what happened the soldier found himself dragged to the bank, disarmed, robbed, his hands bound behind him, and his feet hobbled. He could speak Spanish, and so could the Tulisanes. Words told him that his captors, only two in number, meant him to march, hobbled as he was, along a path which they pointed out. But it took several sharp pricks from a campolin, which one of them carried to make him start. For the path led away from the river, away from Pasai, from Ilo Ilo, and the Utica, which he would have given his life itself rather than fail to reach in time. Only a little way back from the river the path began to leave the lowland, mounting up to the hills among which the Tulisanes had their camp. Sometimes one of the brigands led the way, with the prisoner between them, sometimes both drove him before them, secure in the knowledge that in his helpless condition he could not escape. The captain's message, in its rubber case, still lay undisturbed and dry within the messenger's jacket. For that he was glad, although his heart sank as every step carried him farther away from the destination of the dispatch, and from the chance of it being delivered in season. The means which Providence uses to accomplish the ends which it desires are marvelous, and those of us who do not believe in Providence say, a strange coincidence. The day before, back among the mountains of Panay, a little old Montese woman, who had never heard of God, or of America, and whose only dress had been thirty yards of fine bamboo plaiting coiled round and round her body, had died. When the dead body had been set properly upright beneath the tiny hut, which had been the woman's home, and food and drink placed beside it for the long journey which the spirit was to take, the hut was abandoned, as is the custom of the tribe, and the men of the family, the woman's sons and nephews, started out with freshly sharpened lances and machetes. For this is the only religion of the Monteses, that no one must be left to go alone upon the long journey. And so, when one of a family dies, the men relatives do not stay their hands until someone, the first person met, is slain by them to go on the journey as an escort. Only if they seek three days through the wood and find no human being, then, after the third day, a beast may be slain, and the law of blood still be satisfied. The sons and nephews of the Montese woman had marched for thirty-six hours, and the steel of their weapons had not been dimmed by any moisture other than the dew, when, suddenly rounding a turn in the mountain path, they met three men. The first of the three at the moment was the Tulisani leader, and him in thirty seconds they had driven six lances through. His partner, with a scream of terror, dashed into the trackless forest and disappeared. He need not. The demand for a sacrifice was appeased, and the men who had killed the Tulisani cared as little for his companion as they did for the white man who had been his prisoner. All they wanted now was to get back to the Bontese country, and to the new huts which their woman would have been building in their absence. The white man's words they could not understand, but his gestures were intelligible, and before they parted, he to hurry back towards the river, and they towards the Montese country, they had cut the cords which bound the soldier's hands, and hobbled his feet, and thus had left him free to make such haste as he could. Even then the afternoon was well nigh gone when the messenger reached the river at the place where he had been dragged from it and practically all his journey was yet before him, wearied as he was. For once, though, fortune favored him. His dugout had grounded on a sandy island hardly a dozen rods below where it had been overturned, and, swimming out to it, he soon had righted it and was on his way again. At first the forest on each side was a tropic swamp. Then the river grew more swift, with here and there rapids in which it took all his skill with his clumsy paddle to keep his boat from being upset. The ground had begun to grow higher here, and back from the banks there were rank growths of hemp and palm trees. A few miles farther, and he was in the mountains, the river winding about like a lane of water between walls which were almost perpendicular, and covered with the densest bright green foliage, in which parrots croaked hoarsely, and monkeys chattered sleepily as they settled themselves for the night. The walls of the living canyon grew narrower and steeper. 
The river here was as still as a lake, and the current so sluggish that only his labor with the paddle sent the banca forward. It grew dark quickly and fast, down in the bottom of this mountain gorge, and by and by, by the twilight glow on the tops of the banks, when he would peer up at them, grew fainter. The soldier strained his eyes to look ahead. Would the living green canyons of that river never end? It was dark now, except that the stars in the narrow line of sky above the gorge sent down light enough to make the surface of the water gleam faintly and mark out his course. He drew his paddle from the water, and holding it so that the drops which trickled from it would make no noise, listened breathlessly for the sound of the falls which marked the site of the village he was to find, and at it leave his boat for the land again. A night bird screamed in the forest, and then there was utter silence until a soft splash in the water beside him revealed the ugly head of a huge black crocodile following the dugout. By and by the stars in the lane of sky above grew dim, and a stronger light, which faintly illuminated the river gorge, told him that the full moon had risen, although not yet high enough to light his course directly. After a time the gorge grew wider, and its sides less steep and high, and then at last he heard the roar of the falls and found the village, and had landed. What time it might be now the sergeant did not dare to guess. A sleepy native pointed out to him the path, stared when the stranger said he must hurry on to Ilo Ilo that night, and flatly refusing to be his guide, went back to bed. The forest path was rankly wet with night dew, and dimly lighted by the moon. The soldier hurried forward, only to find that in his haste he had missed the main path. Slowly and anxiously he retraced his way until he found the right road again, and then went forward slowly enough now to go with care. And so at last he saw before him the city of Ilo Ilo, only to learn, when he was challenged by a picket, that it was one o'clock, and that the Utica had steamed out of the harbor an hour before. Useless as he feared the dispatch might be now, Sergeant Johnson insisted that it be delivered at once, and that he be given an opportunity to ask to be allowed to tell the general why he was so late. When that officer, roused from sleep, had read the dispatch and heard the story briefly, for there were other things to be thought of then, he told the young man, You have done well, for he knew the ways of Filipino Tulisanes. And after all, perhaps, you may not be too late. But before he explained what he meant by the last part of his sentence, the general called for one of his aides, and, as soon as a man could be brought, hastily gave him certain orders with instructions that they were to be communicated to the officers whom they concerned, as quickly as was possible, regardless of how sound asleep those gentlemen might be. Then, because he was at heart a kindly man, and because he felt that the water-soaked, thorn-torn soldier before him, pale with weariness and anxiety, had done his best, the general told him what was the nature of the dispatch, and why, even then, he might yet be in time. For by another of the fortunate dispensations of Providence, or, if you please, by a strange coincidence, that very afternoon another American gunboat had unexpectedly steamed into the harbor of Ilo Ilo and dropped anchor. The general had sent messages to the commander of the Ogdensburg, explaining the situation to him, and as soon as that officer understood the matter, he replied, You did just right. We will start in pursuit of the Utica as soon as we can get up steam, and do our best to overtake her. Could they overtake her? That was the question. She had a good three hours start, for daylight was breaking before the Ogdensburg could be got under way, and the registered speed of the boats was about equal. At any rate, there was doubt enough as to what the result would be, so that when the Ogdensburg reached the town of Conception, fifty miles up the coast from Ilo Ilo, and the Utica was seen to be lying at anchor in the harbor there, the commander of the Ogdensburg said words which were as thankful as they were emphatic, for just beyond Conception Harbor began the narrow channels of the Gigantes Islands, in some of which he had feared to find the gunboat wrecked. When the captain of the Utica came to know why he was pursued, and what he had escaped, he was as grateful for the faulty cylinder head which had delayed him, as, the night before, he had been exasperated by it. The pilot, charged with his treachery, proved at once that the charge was true, by turning traitor again, and offering to buy the safety of his own neck, by guiding the boats, to where they could shell the woods in which the natives were hidden. End of A Question of Time Tree Ticket by Anton Chekhov This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Macbeth. The Lottery Ticket by Anton Chekhov. Ivan Dmitrich, a middle-class man who lived with his family 
on an income of twelve hundred a year, and was very well satisfied with his lot, sat down on the sofa after supper, and began reading the newspaper. "'I forgot to look at the newspaper today,' his wife said to him as she cleared the table. "'Look and see whether the list of drawings is there.' "'Yes, it is,' said Ivan Dmitritch. "'But hasn't your ticket lapsed?' "'No, I took the interest on Tuesday.' What is the number? Series 9, 499, number 26. All right, we will look. 9, 499, and 26. Ivan Dmitritch had no faith in lottery luck, and would not, as a rule, have consented to look at the lists of winning numbers. But now, as he had nothing else to do, and as the newspaper was before his eyes, he passed his finger downwards along the column of numbers and immediately, as though in mockery of his scepticism, no further than the second line from the top, his eye was caught by the figure 9499. Unable to believe his eyes, he hurriedly dropped the paper on his knees without looking to see the number of the ticket, and, just as though someone had given him a douche of cold water, he felt an agreeable chill in the pit of his stomach, tingling and terrible and sweet. Masha! Nine four nine nine is there, he said in a hollow voice. His wife looked at his astonished and panic-stricken face, and realized that he was not joking. Nine four nine nine, she asked, turning pale and dropping the folded tablecloth on the table. Yes, yes, it is really is there. And the number of the ticket? Oh yes, there's the number of the ticket too. But stay, wait. No, I say. Anyway. The number of our series is there. Anyway, you understand. Looking at his wife, Ivan Dmitritch gave a broad, senseless smile, like a baby when a bright object is shown it. His wife smiled too. It was as pleasant to her as to him that he only mentioned the series, and did not try to find out the number of the winning ticket. To torment and tantalize oneself with hopes of possible fortune is so sweet, so thrilling. It is our series, said Ivan Dmitritch after a long silence. So there is a probability that we have won. It's only a probability, but there it is. Well, now look. Wait a little. We have plenty of time to be disappointed. It's on the second line from the top. So the prize is seventy-five thousand. That's not money, but power. Capital. And in a minute I shall look at the list. And there, twenty-six, eh? I say, what if we really have one? The husband and wife began laughing and staring at one another in silence. The possibility of winning bewildered them. They could not have said, could not have dreamed, what they both needed that seventy-five thousand for, what they would buy, where they would go. They thought only of the figures nine four nine nine and seventy-five thousand, and pictured them in their imagination, while somehow they could not think of the happiness itself which was so possible. Ivan Dmitritch, holding the paper in his hand, walked several times from corner to corner, and only when he had recovered from the first impression, began dreaming a little. And if we have one, he said, why, it will be a new life, it will be a transformation. The ticket is yours. But if it were mine, I should, first of all, of course, spend twenty-five thousand on real property in the shape of an estate, ten thousand on immediate expenses, new furnishing, travelling, paying debts, and so on. The other forty thousand I would put in the bank and get interest on it. Yes, an estate, that would be nice, said his wife, sitting down and dropping her hands in her lap. Somewhere in the Tula or Oriol provinces. In the first place, we shouldn't need a summer villa, and besides, it would always bring in an income. And pictures came crowding on his imagination, each more gracious and poetical than the last. And in all these pictures he saw himself well-fed, serene, healthy, felt warm, even hot. Here, after eating a summer soup, cold as ice, he lay on his back on the burning sand close to a stream, or in the garden under a lime tree. It is hot. His little boy and girl are crawling about near him, digging in the sand or catching ladybirds in the grass. He dozes sweetly, 
thinking of nothing, and feeling all over that he need not go to the office today, tomorrow, or the day after. Or, tired of lying still, he goes to the hayfield, or to the forest for mushrooms, or watches the peasants catching fish with a net. When the sun sets, he takes a towel and soap, and saunters to the bathing shed, where he undresses at his leisure, slowly rubs his bare chest with his hands, and goes into the water. And in the water, near the opaque, soapy circles, little fish flit to and fro, and green water weeds nod their heads. After bathing, there is tea with cream and milk rolls. In the evening, a walk, or vint with the neighbours. Yes, it would be nice to buy an estate, said his wife, also dreaming. And from her face, it was evident that she was enchanted by her thoughts. Ivan Dmitritch pictured to himself autumn, with its rains, its cold evenings, and its St. Martin's summer. At that season, he would have to take longer walks about the garden and beside the river, so as to get thoroughly chilled, and then drink a big glass of vodka and eat a salted mushroom or a soused cucumber, and then drink another. The children would come running from the kitchen garden, bringing a carrot and a radish smelling of fresh earth, and then he would lie stretched full length on the sofa, and in leisurely fashion turn over the pages of some illustrated magazine, or, covering his face with it and unbuttoning his waistcoat, give himself up to slumber. The St. Martin's summer is followed by cloudy, gloomy weather. It rains day and night, the bare trees weep, the wind is damp and cold. The dogs, the horses, the fowls, all are wet, depressed, downcast. There is nowhere to walk, one can't go out for days together. One has to pace up and down the room, looking despondently at the grey window. It is dreary. Ivan Dmitritch stopped and looked at his wife. I should go abroad, you know, Masha, he said. And he began thinking how nice it would be in late autumn to go abroad somewhere to the south of France, to Italy, to India. I should certainly go abroad too, his wife said. But look at the number of the ticket. Wait, wait. He walked about the room and went on thinking. It occurred to him, what if his wife really did go abroad? It is pleasant to travel alone, or in the society of light, careless women who live in the present, and not such as think and talk all the journey about nothing but their children, sigh and tremble with dismay over every farthing. Ivan Dmitritch imagined his wife in the train with a multitude of parcels, baskets and bags. She would be sighing over something, complaining that the train made her head ache, that she had spent so much money. At the stations he would continually be having to run for boiling water, bread and butter. She wouldn't have dinner because of its being too dear. She would begrudge me every farthing, he thought, with a glance at his wife. The lottery ticket is hers, not mine. Besides, what is the use of her going abroad? What does she want there? She would shut herself up in the hotel and not let me out of her sight. I know. And for the first time in his life, his mind dwelt on the fact that his wife had grown elderly and plain, and that she was saturated through and through with the smell of cooking, while he was still young, fresh, and healthy, and might well have got married again. Of course, all that is silly nonsense, he thought, but why should she go abroad? What would she make of it? And yet she would go, of course, I can fancy. In reality, it is all one to her, whether it is Naples or Clin, she would only be in my way. I should be dependent upon her. I can fancy how, like a regular woman, she will lock the money up as soon as she gets it. She will hide it from me. She will look after her relations and grudge me every farthing. Ivan Dmitritch thought of her relations. All those wretched brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles would come crawling about as soon as they heard of the winning ticket would begin whining like beggars, and fawning upon them with oily, hypocritical smiles. Wretched, detestable people! If they were given anything, they would ask for more, while if they were refused, they would swear at them, slander them, and wish them every kind of misfortune. Ivan Dmitritch remembered his own relations, and their faces, 
at which he had looked impartially in the past, struck him now as repulsive and hateful. They are such reptiles, he thought. And his wife's face, too, struck him as repulsive and hateful. Anger surged up in his heart against her, and he thought malignantly. She knows nothing about money, and so she is stingy. If she won it, she would give me a hundred roubles, and put the rest away under lock and key. And he looked at his wife, not with a smile now, but with hatred. She glanced at him, too, and also with hatred and anger. She had her own daydreams, her own plans, her own reflections. She understood perfectly well what her husband's dreams were. She knew who would be the first to try and grab her winnings. It's very nice making daydreams at other people's expense, is what her eyes expressed. No, don't you dare. Her husband understood her look. Hatred began stirring again in his breast. And in order to annoy his wife, he glanced quickly, to spite her, at the fourth page, on the newspaper, and read out triumphantly. Series 9499, number 46, not 26. Hatred and hope both disappeared at once, and it began immediately to seem to Ivan Dmitrich and his wife that their rooms were dark and small and low-pitched, that the supper they had been eating was not doing them good, but lying heavy on their stomachs, that the evenings were long and wearisome. What the devil's the meaning of it? said Ivan Dmitrich, beginning to be ill-humoured. Wherever one steps, there are bits of paper under one's feet, crumbs, husks. The rooms are never swept. One is simply forced to go out. Damnation take my soul entirely. I shall go and hang myself on the first aspen tree. End of story. Recording by Andrew Macbeth.